Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Boise City Planning and Zoning Commission public hearing. We have a few extra opening remarks this evening, and then the chair will go into further detail on how we will proceed tonight and the rest of the week. This commission is made up of citizen volunteers appointed by the mayor and approved by the city council. They make final decisions on conditional use permits, variances and appeals, and recommendations to the city council on subdivisions, rezones, annexations, as well as code or comprehensive plan amendments, as is the case with this week's agenda. Each hearing this week will be held in hybrid format. Everyone from the public entering the hearing virtually has been automatically muted and cannot speak. Once time for testimony has begun, virtually raise your hand and you'll be called upon and unmuted. There is a chat function in Zoom, but this is not part of the record and should only be used if technical difficulties arise. Our schedule this week is a little different than usual in that the procedure for public hearing will be stretched out over multiple days. Yesterday, we heard from staff in the neighborhood associations. Today, we'll begin with a brief presentation from the planning team to follow up on some questions uh, from yesterday, and then we'll proceed to public testimony, starting with those who signed up in advance, then anyone else who signed up here in person, and then anyone else who raises their hand virtually. If you are attending through your telephone, you can type in star nine to raise your hand. Each member of the public is allowed up to three minutes for testimony. We are strict with this time as it is limited in code. Public testimony will continue into Wednesday and Thursday as needed. If at any point we have no more folks signed up to testify, the public hearing portion will be closed. Staff will be given time for a rebuttal and the commission will deliberate and render a recommendation. Finally, please expect a few quick breaks from proceedings this evening, as well as a half hour dinner break at seven. And uh, Mr. Chair, you have the floor. Okay, thanks, Crystal. Good evening, everybody. Before we start tonight, I'd like to remind us all a few um, why we are here and how we are gonna operate this evening. Our main goal tonight is to have a fair hearing, a hearing where all voices are heard with courtesy and respect. And so we have a few uh, simple rules for tonight's hearing. First, please do not call out, cheer, clap, or heckle from the audience. Please do not interrupt the speaker. Everyone here will get a chance to speak tonight. Second, when speaking, please address your comments to the commission and not to other audience members or city staff. We uh, receive comments with raised voices or profanities. We'll stop your time and push you to the end of the line for public comment. You are welcome to ask a question. However, staff and the commission will not answer your question during your testimony. We're gonna reserve uh, answering questions when we're in deliberation later this week. We have a lot of interest, of course, in this item tonight. So a couple other points. If you submitted written comments ahead of the hearing, we want to make it clear that we have read your comments. You do not need to repeat your comments verbatim tonight. We plan to close the hearing around 10 o'clock this evening. If we get much later, it makes us tough to deliberate. Uh, and none of us, including staff, and you all want to be here into the morning hours. <clears throat> As Crystal just outlined, um, the order is gonna uh, continue with a little bit of city staff and Q&A to start out the evening. Um, and then we'll move into public testimony. Uh, you all will get three minutes to speak. Please start with your name and address when you come up to the podium. Um, and we're gonna be really uh, strict on that time limit. We have a lot of folks to get through. We have about, I think around 75 folks that signed up ahead of time. We also have a handful of folks that signed up tonight. We're gonna go through that list in the order that people signed up. And again, three minutes is your time. Please start with your name and address when you uh, reach the podium. Um, and then after that, we will eventually get into uh, deliberation and make a recommendation to city council here either tomorrow night or on Thursday. That's the plan anyway. Um, thank you again for coming tonight. We had a good discussion last night with the neighborhood associations and city staff. We're really uh, hopeful to have a good discussion again tonight, continue the good energy that's going on with this discussion about this zoning code rewrite. <clears throat> Um, I think with that, uh, as Crystal mentioned, we'll have a dinner break about seven o'clock for about a half hour. So seven, 7.30, plan on a dinner break. Um, at, that, at this point, I think we'll call the roll and uh, make sure we're all here. Stead. Schaefer. Here. Squires. Blanchard. Here. Moore. Here. Gillespie. Still here. Finbrock. Here. Danley. Here. Mooney. Here. Seven present, two absent. Okay. Thank you. Uh, all right. So we left off last night. We had some pretty good um, question, questions and discussion with the neighborhood associations. Staff has uh, some follow-up information from that discussion last night. So Tim, do you just want to kick us off? Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the commission. Again, thank you for 
the time you give to the city and the residents of the city by serving on the Planning and Zoning Commission, a reminder to everybody, the Planning and Zoning Commission is a volunteer service, uh, and they uh, spend every month getting into very emotional and personal issues dealing with property and development in the city. Great. And also um, to everybody that's here tonight and throughout this process that's shared opinions of all kinds, everybody in my experience throughout this process that's come to our meetings, including last night and I'm sure tonight, is just expressing genuine concern for the future of Boise and we're trying to get this right and, and do the best we can. So appreciate everybody's commitment to this. I wanted to follow up on, uh, start with a specific question from last night that uh, Commissioner Gillespie initially raised and we had some discussion about, and that is the, the proposal within this ordinance to convert some properties to R2. Just a reminder to those that weren't here, um, among the recommendations of this ordinance is to uh, rezone selectively in the city properties that are in places where we feel like density would be very helpful. And so that comes down to three corridors in the city, State Street, Vista, and Fairview, where we have our best bus service today, where we're investing as a community in improved public transportation. And so in those places, we've wanted to, through this process, uh, create the zoning that would allow what we need, that denser development, pedestrian designed to happen. So that's those three corridors. And it also is applied to what are called activity centers. The term activity center comes from our comprehensive plan, which is called, called Blueprint Boise. Blueprint Boise identified these activity centers, which are kind of low, de low density in the sense that one story commercial with lots of surface parking, that's what it tends to be. Think of Overland Drive near the cinemas or the area around the mall and places like that. So activity centers. This MX3 is the zone that we're proposing for just those areas. So it's, it's a relatively small amount of the city, but it's an important part of the city that it get denser. And, and, and so that's the proposal. Well, the R2 aspect of it is along those three corridors, State, Vista, and Fairview, we've also proposed to uh, rezone the properties that are adjacent to those fronting those streets to what's called R2. So that makes the properties behind these the ones fronting on those streets a little bit taller, a little bit denser. And the thinking behind that is that rather than have an abrupt transition from the taller, denser, buildings on State Vista Fairview, let's kind of have a step down and then go to the R2 and then ultimately to the R1. And the question last night is how many properties are impacted by that? So I'm going to go through each of those corridors really quickly and tell you about that. Um, so <laughs> citywide, well, first of all, in the upper right here, you can see what amount of the city is zoned R2, and currently 5% of the city is zoned R2. And with the proposal that's associated with this new ordinance, that would go to 5.7% of the city. So a modest increase in R2 in the city. Uh, what we're proposing, then you get into the chart, and what we're proposing is for the whole city, a total of 257 acres gets converted from what is now R1 to R2. So it's citywide, 257 acres, and then 1,021 parcels are associated with that citywide. So you can see what that is as a percentage of the whole city. You can also see on the right here, what that conversion is as a, as a percentage of the total residential parcels in the city. So the, you can see that as a percentage of acres and parcels. So the highest number there citywide is 1.3% of the total parcels, residential parcels in the city get converted as in association with this uh, rezoning. And then you can see it by area. So we went neighborhood by neighborhood to look at acreage, parcels, what's converted, what percentage that is of, of that neighborhood and, and so forth. So you can see at North End, Sunset, we were speaking about Veterans Park last night. 
what you'll see is the total in Veterans Park percentage uh, of acres is 3.1%. Uh, and then as much as 6% when you get to the, the percentage of residential parcels, both in terms of acre, acreage and parcels. But you can see it by neighborhood here. And that's along the State Street corridor. When we get to Vista, the area that has the most acreage anywhere in the city is the properties fronting Vista and within the neighborhood, the Depot Bench. And then you see the Vista neighborhood there as well. But uh, even in the case of the Depot Bench, which has the highest number of acres and number of parcels, the highest percentage here again is converted as residential parcels, just residential parcels that percentage that's converted to R2 is 8% max. So that's the, uh, the maximum amount in any neighborhood. And then you can see on Fairview here as well, those numbers for each of the neighborhoods that's impacted along Fairview. Again, all, all numbers are relatively small. I'll say that you, you, you might conclude that doesn't seem like a dramatic change. These are very small percentages and so forth. I will say it's as small as it might be, we also think it's very important because the goal here was to uh, enact an ordinance that puts in place kind of an ideal land use and development scenario. We weren't, I mean, the, the rules around conversion map, the conversion map and how we rezone things, we weren't seeking to create a, a medium condition. We were trying to get to what's the ideal condition. And we do think that in close proximity to those streets where we have the best transit, we should take advantage of that and try to move beyond just the frontage. Now, I'll say there was a lot of discussion of that in the CAC throughout our process, the Citizens Advisory Committee, because the way that, that we determine this number of parcels that are affected is that it's an eighth of a mile from the center line of those streets. So if you're an eighth of a mile from the center line of those streets, but you're not those MX3 parcels fronting on the street, then that's where we that's the rule in terms of then conversion to R2 from R1. And, and, you know, when you look at transit planning, typically a quarter of a mile is the, is the kind of standard when it comes to what's the kind of area that you're seeking to get denser around a transit stop tends to be a five minute walk. What's an easy walk for most people. And so it tends to be a quarter mile. We're talking about an eighth of a mile here. So this is a, a very kind of surgical change here. And, and the discussion among the CAC was, should it be more really? Should we go to the quarter mile and that kind of thing? But, but I think the important aspect of this, because the discussion yesterday to some degree was about how many properties are impacted by this. And now you have those numbers, but really it's, it's, it's about what are we trying to achieve, I think, as a city. And this is our one opportunity, again, 60 years to try to put in place a new pattern that supports a different kind of transportation investment we're making. And this R2 conversion is an important part of that as part of this MX3 transit corridor activity center proposal that are within this ordinance. So that's one thing. So with that, I might just stop there for a second before I move on to another item and see if there's any questions about these numbers. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Gillespie. So um, as you will appreciate, Director Keene, over the, over the night, I thought of a whole bunch more analytical tasks, but, <laughs> uh, but be that as it may. So, so we're going to create uh, 1,021 R2 parcels out of existing R1B and R1C parcels. And I'll bet you someone over there knows the, the increased number of housing units that that action creates. And I'll bet you it's on the order of between six and eight units per parcel in terms of extra density that that change creates. So I bet you we're talking five to 8,000 potential, it's just purely potential additional housing units. Does that math seem generally correct? I'm not sure about you're, five We're going, I think thousand. we go from what? Eight to 12 or eight mm -hmm. to 16? Well, here's one way to think about it to your, the, the issue you're trying to get to, which is what 
what number of units or dwellings, uh, what density we would achieve through this conversion. So within the R2 district, the lot size is 2,000 square feet. And this is kind of where you were going last night, which is what then, if it's rezoned to R2, what then could we subdivide these parcels to create? What's the maximum number of parcels? The, the lot size within that zone is 2,000 square feet. So if you look at the amount of acreage, so, and you can look at the amount of acreage associated with the conversion within any one of these neighborhoods, and you'll see what I, the range that you'll see here, and this is very theoretical, because as you know, as you see in the cases that you are presented with every month, when it comes to a subdivision, the specifics of the site really matter in terms of what you can actually achieve. We haven't done that analysis here across all these parcels, of course, and that would take a, a tremendous amount of time, not during this hearing week, but 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 if you just take the 2000 square feet and said okay we've got a perfect condition across mm -hmm. these acres right. what number of lots are you achieving and the range that you get across these neighborhoods is between about 200 and the max being a thousand in the cases of the depot bench and that's purely the math associated with 2000 square foot lots and if you if you rezone these and those were maximized based on that zoning between 200 lots and 1,000, with the most being in that 46 acres that are created on the depot bench. Um, one thing about the depot bench, too, and the bench in general along Vista is that those blocks lay out pretty nicely um, for this in the sense that there's a good grid of streets. Mm -hmm. You know, it just lays out well versus a state street where the, the grid is, once you get past the north end, it's less regular, you know, so it it doesn't work out as well. So I think that's one of the reasons that the, the bench ended up being impacted more. It's just the nature of those blocks there. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, please, Mill. Yeah, and I guess the reason I'm talking about this is, you know, in the end of the day, everything has costs and benefits. There's a cost to doing this. The cost is the disruption of the nearby parcels and, and you know, just this fact going from R1 to R2. The benefit is the additional density we create along these corridors. So it would be nice to have some estimates of the additional number of potential dwelling units that this exercise, that this piece of the exercise creates, because I'm guessing it's a fairly substantial portion of the total housing enabled by the whole shooting match, by the whole thing, right? So I'd kind of like to, if you guys can kind of give us a feel, not now, but before we wrap up, if you could sort of give me a feel for, are we talking 10,000 new units enabled by doing this or five or two or one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on this topic, guys? All right. Okay. The second topic is related to the, the uh, public involvement related to these different types. We talked at different times last night about the four types that are part of this new ordinance and mm -hmm. in seeking to, number one, create some simplification of the ordinance as it relates to process, and number two, to make what we want and need easier to accomplish and put the community and get the community involved through our processes and helping make sure this ordinance is successful. Here are the four types again, and we just wanted to note within each of those four types what the what the notice is related to those. And so you have the development tracker, of course, in every case, but in the case of the type one and type twos, the neighborhood associations are in fact, as they are today, notified of those cases and then once you move beyond those type twos and you get into cases that uh, by state law really uh, are required to have a public hearing so conditional use permits annexations rezonings variance uh, what else uh, plan unit developments those kinds of things then you get into a hearing uh, but it also includes in the type three the uh, cases that go to the Historic Preservation Commission and the Design Review Commission, um, one of the ways that the reasons that we organized it this way was just to be cognizant of that we're sending cases 
to the body that is most appropriate to send them to. So for instance, the Planning and Zoning Commission is here to hear cases of land use and, and kind of land use policy and, and regulatory policy. The Design Review Commission, of course, is here on architecture and design related issues. The Historic Preservation exists to commission to consider cases that are related to preservation of historic properties in the city. So, um, so this is, um, I, I also wanna mention, go back to a lot of the discussion last night related to how long the community has been involved in this process and had time to review what's before you this week. And just in part, cause I wanna mention one thing about when, when the ordinances were released, but I think one thing to remind the commission about and the community about is that last summer we made some really significant changes to what was proposed. When you think about this longer process that's been going on for years, there was discussion about modules one and two, phases one and two that go back to late 2021, early 2022. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of people within the community that were not happy about what was being proposed. And that resulted in significant changes to this ordinance. That at the time, originally in modules one and two, we were proposing to consolidate the three R1 districts into two. So eliminate the, the 20,000 square foot R1 district and make them two. We, we did not do that in this draft. We, we also tied our incentives. We, we, changed the ordinance to tie increases in density in those R1 districts to affordability. That was a significant change that happened at that time. At that time, we created all the MX districts. They didn't even exist at the time. And because of the feedback around, hey, this is just there's one size fits all, a whole new set of standards came out and a whole new set of public hearings were held in the summer of last year around neighborhood zoning and the mixed use districts. And really, really significant changes came out of that. I mentioned last night that then um, the, the original draft of the entire ordinance came out in September. That was wrong. The actual data came out was October 11th of last year. On October 11th, 11th of last year, we released the full draft of the ordinance. So people could start reviewing that. And these four types here were all part of that draft <laughs> in the in the summer and fall of last year, or when we got into this third phase around process, we talked about these four types immediately and what the purpose of creating the four types and how we wanted to involve people in approval such that they were helping make this successful. That discussion started late summer last year into the third phase, which all was part of that October 11th release. There was issues around, okay, then we released the actual ordinance that's before you at the end of February. I will also say about that, that we, in releasing that, said we want to meet with any neighborhood that wants to, to go through the deal details of this. We had some neighborhoods take us up on that as recently as within the last two weeks. We had, for instance, we had a very detailed long conversation with the East End neighborhood over every detail of, of what was impacting the R1 districts that, that are part of not only R1, but R2, I'm, I'm sorry, R1 and R2, because much of East End is R2. But anyway, we went through this in great detail. I guess the point really is the public involvement in this so shaped what you have before you, and much of it was in place, all the basic structure of it was in place on October 11th of last year. And then even, the details that came out at the end of February, we've spent time, it, we've had a few cases where uh, we've met with neighborhoods where they didn't understand the details. The issue wasn't understanding them. The issue was, do we agree with them or not? <laughs> which, is, which is why we're here, right? Like we have a proposal, not everyone's going to agree with it, but we make a decision and move forward as a city. And then the last thing I wanted to mention oh, it's not on here actually, is because affordability came up several times last night and I jumped through it in my initial opening slides related to inclusionary zoning. The city is not permitted by state law to do inclusionary zoning, to be clear. This was in the memo that you received on, on uh, April 13th, where we went through some things that 
from a legal standpoint, either we weren't dealing with in this ordinance or we felt you needed some background to, to understand what the implications from a legal standpoint were. And in getting that legal advice early on, it was that we can't do inclusionary zoning in this, in this state. So the, that is why this ordinance has been structured around density incentives that require affordability. And so I mention it because several times last night it was, why don't we just require affordability? And we can't do that. We have to structure the ordinance such that when you're getting something, we're, we're tying that, that additional density to the affordability part. And of course, in this ordinance, we also have those requirements around water and energy conservation. That's also part of those incentives. Um, that is the conclusion of my uh, response to the hot topics last night. Happy to answer questions if you have any or sit down. I go. Mr. Chairman. Right. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Wish I'd just like to thank uh, mm -hmm. you, Director, and a few of the other folks over there I know who, who did that work probably starting early this morning. So I appreciate it very much. Okay, and then to Mr. Daly, did you have a question? Yep, I real quick. Um, Tim, I got to say something you said yesterday right off the bat hit me pretty, pretty hard. And I think it would be worth a quick minute for you to touch on it one more time. Doing the math, 527 is the number of variances and PUDs in total over the last five years. I know for me sitting up here for about seven years, that means I'm, I don't know, seven, 800 of those, right? And, and I'm just, what you said about the PUD in particular, and it essentially being a symptom of a, of a broken system, right? Yeah, that, that particularly struck me. And as well as the number of decisions and just adding them up, we're hitting somewhere in the neighborhood of about six or seven every single hearing, right? Variance or PUD. Can you touch on that one more time? Just your, your general sentiment about the relationship between so many PUD applications and our existing code, and then how this code sort of, yeah. in your opinion, fixes or addresses those. Right, and, and this came up in the context of a slide where we were showing one of the ways that you measure how broken your ordinance is, and this came up in the diagnostic that the city did with our consultant Clarion uh, at the beginning of this process, but what you found is that we have so many cases that come before this commission and ultimately council in many cases that are plan unit developments. And you got to remember when you're doing so many plan unit developments, it means that you're creating individual zoning districts all over the city because each plan unit development is a zoning district in and of itself. And, and that is necessary because the code that you have doesn't have any clear direction for anyone. <laughs> so we have an ordinance that isn't clear as to what we're trying to accomplish as a city. So, so many times we're having to then create new uh, districts just in association with a single development, which requires so much time and effort and, and kind of compromise among everybody involved in those properties in the, that that you've really got to start from scratch and, and say, what are you trying to do here? What's the city you're trying to build? So I think the, the point of this, and I heard someone mention this in another public meeting, is that really what, uh, one of the great valuable things of this is that we're, we're getting what we want out of development. And I know we hear people have different perspectives on, on what the city needs, but but the point is we've got to come to consensus on what we as a community feel are the important aspects of each development, no matter the scale, and require that of everyone, not require a customized zoning every time someone needs to build something. And so that is one of the values of this process and why we've been saying since the fall that the point of this is to create a code that allows us to achieve what we want, not a code that just creates ways to argue with each other. Okay. Any questions from this end? Is good. Okay. All right, Tim. Thanks for the update and uh, your comment comments there. Okay. <clears throat> we'll go ahead then. We're going to open this hearing up for public testimony on this item. So, 
Again, folks, we had uh, people sign up in advance. I've got the list here. We're going to run through that list. I'll call names starting from those who uh, signed up first to the folks that signed up here tonight, uh, just in the lobby outside of Chambers here. Uh, podium is up here. Please come on up when your name is called and, and um, you can give your testimony. Um, again, please start with your name and address for the record. And as Commissioner Gillespie is indicating over here to my right, uh, three minutes is your testimony time. Uh, we have, uh, I think I mentioned we have 75 folks that signed up in advance, plus some other folks that signed up. So if you do the math, we're going to be here for a few hours um, if everybody uses their three minutes. And I'll be honest with you, uh, the part I like least about this job is cutting folks off at three minutes. So if you can do us all solid and watch the time, it'll be up here on the screen to your right. Um, and then we will uh, move on to the next person. Okay. So with that, um, up first, I have uh, Alan McLeod, followed by Byron uh, Falwell, and then Robert Frazier. If you guys, yeah. when your name's called, if, if the people on deck and in the in the in the box want to come on down and just sit in the front then we can cycle faster uh, uh through the process good to go go for it hello everyone my name is alan mcleod i live in the collister neighborhood at 4613 west castle bar drive and i'm here to voice my support for the modern zoning code as an occupant of the city I would like to see an increased density and more mixed use, walkable, pedestrian friendly areas. I believe this code is a step in the right direction to allowing those kind of environments. And it will also provide the safe flexibility to change over time as areas need to adapt to current needs rather than dividing the city into single use areas as it has been for decades. I also believe for Boise to be financially secure in the coming years, that needs to be able to support its local infrastructure. If Boise continues to sprawl as it has, it will become impossible at a certain point to maintain the roadways, sewers, bridges, and other city managed infrastructure that all of us are depending on. I think a focus must be placed on efficient land use, efficiency as measured in dollars per acre. And I believe a good way to boost that efficiency is to increase density reduce emphasis on parking, and to make use of our existing infrastructure. I believe the modern zoning code will give Boise a chance uh, to make use of those assets and be in a good position going forward. Certainly better than the existing zoning code would allow us to be. If I were to ask for any changes, it would have been to push further and reduce lot sizes more and increase density in areas and to eliminate the parking minimums in all of the mixed use areas. However, I realize you're trying to strike a balance uh, and I can appreciate all the work that Tim and his team have been doing on this project. My main ask would be that we go forward with something that is good and I believe what you have is good. I don't want this to get hung up and debated to death, trying to perfect every single page and sentence. I'd like to just thank everyone who's been involved in this project for all the work. As a project manager, I know that a lot of effort goes into all of this and I hope to see it come to fruition. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Okay, up next, Byron Falwell and then Robert Frazier and then Mike DiVittorio. Byron Falwell, 23 North Roosevelt Street. Chairman, commissioners, thank you for this, your service to this community and for your being here tonight to hear testimony, some of it conflicting, and for doing the hard work of deliberating and recommending the new zoning code. I am in support of the modern zoning code with the acknowledgement that we still have work to do as a community before we see an abundance of housing in Boise. I'm here as an architect and with Neighbors for Boise, a local uh, group advocating for more and better homes in Boise. <clears throat> Over the last three and a half years, I've had the privilege to serve on the Citizen Advisory Committee for this new code. During that time, I focused on neighborhood scale, multifamily homes, also known as missing metal housing. As an architect and a Boise homeowner, I know that neighborhood scale multifamily homes belong in every Boise neighborhood. They're livable for a wide variety of people. And the reason that we haven't been building enough of them has everything to do with the way our current code was written. 
Our current code, in our current code, there exist tools of segregation that were specifically designed to separate us by income, by class, by status. <clears throat> the effects of that can be seen today as some Boiseans picket and protest against the inclusion of multifamily homes in their neighborhoods. Single family exclusionary zoning has done so much harm to the way that we live together as a city but it has also delivered to us an affordability crisis that will take a long time to recover from. We need a code that will deliver the housing choice that Boiseans, Boiseans deserve. People need a variety of housing choices in order to find their right-sized right home in a neighborhood that they love near school, work, and play. Not everyone needs or wants a single family home. People need right-sized homes, not only to survive, but to thrive. And that is what I want for every Boisean. Duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, ADUs, neighborhood scales, zero parked multifamily, cottage courts, cottage villages, condos, townhomes, cooperative living, boarding houses, courtyard apartments, all of these are homes. Homes for people. And they belong in every neighborhood. I'll leave you with this. Our old codes separated us from each other. Give us a code that lets us live together in neighborhoods throughout Boise. Thank you. Thank you. I'm next, Robert Frazier, then Mike DiVittorio, then Patrick Spouts. Commissioners, thank you for a chance to speak to this. My name is Robert Frazier and I live in the West Bench neighborhood. There are dozens of reasons why I believe that this is a great move for our city, but I want to outline the top five reasons to support the zoning code rewrite. The first is, lower red tape for ordinary uses of private property. We shouldn't have to ask permission to use our houses in ways that support our families and provide housing. And the rewrite gives us more uses by right and limits the process for neighbors to comment by simplifying the process to administrative approvals. Uh, great neighborhoods come through mixed use development. And we, unfortunately the last code written six years ago did not support walkable neighborhoods local markets, office space, and light commercial and residential areas to the detriment of our city. We want to see diverse types of buildings and uses in existing neighborhoods through mixed use development, neighborhood cafes and bodegas built to make walkable, intimate businesses that support the way that we live our lives. Third, higher density creates affordable housing and currently under existing code, the single family home lots allow duplexes by right. Under the rewrite, fourplexes will be allowed with half the units being long-term affordable housing. This is a great first step in increasing density that preserves neighborhoods through limits and affordability. We will see neighborhoods change slowly as neighbors and homeowners choose to leverage their single family homes for duplexes and fourplexes that will fit the modern market. Higher density development is encouraged along the best transit lines. And I think that this is an important piece of the new zoning. We believe the high, highest density is not gonna make sense in close proximity to single family homes with limited parking and public transit. And the rewrite has done a great job of putting the highest density along State Street, Vista and Fairview that have bus routes that go every 15 minutes. And fifth, small scale retail and cafes and neighborhoods create very livable, beautiful neighborhoods. Best parts of the oldest Neighborhoods in our city in the north and east end allow very diverse business and residential uses that make them unique and interesting walkable neighborhoods. We want to thank this administration, the previous administration and the current council and this commission for your work and passion to spend precious political capital to start the work of modernizing our zoning code for a city that exists today rather than a world that no longer exists from 60 years ago. My children are fifth generation Boiseans fourth generation West Bench natives. My grandparents bought a house in Winstead Park for $25,000 in 1952. My parents bought a house at Maple Grove and Eustick for 50,000 in 1980. And I bought a house off Mountain View in 2016 for $242,000. And it's now worth $550,000. At this rate, by the time my oldest daughter turns 30, a house in the West Bench will be north of $6 million. The only way to combat that increase in value over time is to build the kind of housing that we need for the, with the affordability mechanisms mm -hmm. in place. Otherwise, my children will be driving from Malheur County to visit their grandparents. Mr. Frazier, thank you. Can we get your address real quick? 3613 North Cabarton. Thank you. Appreciate it. 
Up next, Mike uh, DiVittorio, the Patrick Spouts, and then Benjamin Zamzo. I should have some, hopefully, some slides coming up. Mm -hmm. um, good yep. evening. My name is Mike DiVittorio. I live at 925 Park Hill Court in Boise. I'm a residential infill developer who builds, holds, and holds for lease single family homes, duplexes, and triplexes in Boise's established neighborhoods. I'm an avid biker, and I'm involved in the leadership of Urban Land Institute here in Idaho. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying thank you to the staff for this uh, three plus year process. Uh, it's been painstaking and to the community and then to you for uh, your work in making our city a great place to live. Um, I'd like to voice support for uh, the zoning code rewrite. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's definitely a step in the right direction it represents incremental progress, allowing our city to accommodate the inevitable growth we'll continue to experience. At the very top of the list of reasons to consider additional changes to the rewrite of the code is the issue of housing affordability. I urge PNZ members and members of council to consider removing parking minimums uh, requirements in all residential zones. I also recommend denser zoning uh, or up zoning along transit corridors and near to activity centers. Uh, so more like within a quarter mile of these transit corridors, corridors instead of an eighth of a mile. Uh, we're just not going to get there with the, it, it, the density that's allowed in the new code. So the second slide I have uh, really talks to the cost of automobiles. So as a developer, excuse uh, me, Mr. DiVitario, if you grab your a clicker. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Okay. Thanks. So as a developer, what I'll tell you is I need to program at least 20% of my uh, site for parking backup space if I do surface parking. If I don't do surface parking and I do structured parking, that's about $40,000 per space. If you translate those card costs into a monthly increase in rent to my tenants who may not have a car, may not be able to afford a car, that's about $250 a month. So add that to the cost of a car, which is probably about $500 a month. If you look at sort of the average car plus gas maintenance insurance, you're at 750 bucks. Um, and we're forcing, because of the park minimum parking requirements, people to um, opt into that model. Um, in addition to those hard costs, there are indirect and hidden costs. Um, the site, site planning is more complicated. You're going to see sites that are not usable at all because of backup space and alley load requirements. You're going to see few, fewer housing choices, a lower mix of one bedrooms and studios. You're going to see uh, traffic congestion, uh, congestion, and you're going to see those who cannot afford or do not want to rely on the personal automobile as uh, forced into that model. So in short, let's remove the parking uh, requirements for all residential zones. I could go on, but my time's up. Great, thank you very much. Hey, Crystal, I see uh, Patrick Spouts is online. Is he available? After Mr. Spouts, we have Benjamin Zamzow and then Nina Schaefer followed by Hillary Vaughn. Thank you. Um, my name is Patrick Spouts. I live at 753 West Sandstone Court, Boise 83702. And thank you, Commission, for this hearing. And thank you to all the city staff for all the hard work they put into making uh, us get as far as we have so far. I would like to speak in strong support of the zoning code. Um, I was a proud member of the Citizens Advisory Committee, like Byron was as well, and was able to witness the process at work as this code has been molded proposed code has been molded over the last several years. Um, I'm also um, a supporter of increased density and reduced parking minimums in the city. And like some of our other speakers so far today, if I would change anything, it would be to be a little bit bolder. Um, I kind of worry that with even with the big positive changes we're making with changes in parking, increased density in moderate ways and mixed use areas, that um, it might not be enough um, yesterday, Richmond, Virginia got rid of parking minimums entirely. And it seems like a, every week, another city somewhere around our size is taking that step. Still, I applaud the bold changes, relatively bold changes we're making today. I'm glad to see it move forward. And I'm excited to see the process play out and hope that we implement the code more or less as written. Thank you so much. Goodbye. 
Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Zamzo. Ben Zamzo, 350 North Knight Street, Boise. Mr. Chair, commissioners, thank you for your time this evening. I've had the opportunity to serve on the Citizens Advisory Committee for the last two and a half years, and I support the rewrite of the current zoning code. As you'll continue to hear this week, the proposed draft is far from perfect, and I'll touch on a couple of those imperfections in a moment. But at the most foundational level, I believe that people will continue to move to Boise over the next few decades, both for quality of life and for the growing employment opportunities, including the $15 billion, with a B, planned micron investment in our economy and the local ripple effects that we'll have throughout our community. Even if you think that there's nothing wrong with Boise today, continued population growth that exceeds the amount and diversity of housing stock that we can build under the current code will cause problems for all of us. Housing prices will be bid up and a more affordable housing stock will be demolished in favor of new, larger single family homes as allowed in the current code. This will push our lower income and service workers further out of town, which adds to congestion, pollution, and rising payroll costs for all of our businesses to compensate these employees for the time, parking, and hassle to commute and work in Boise. These rising payroll costs will either come out of the profits of our community businesses or get passed onto the consumer in the form of higher prices or both. The proposed zoning code attempts to give the city and developers more tools in their toolbox to address the needs of a growing city. My focus on the CAC has been on the proposed mixed use zones. I support the increased opportunities for neighborhood retail by way of the new MX1 zone and the neighborhood cafes. And I support that the new code allows for more density, taller height limits along our corridors and a mix of retail office and residential uses within the zones. This density over time, particularly along these transit lines may ultimately lead to a more robust mass, mass transit system one day. However, I have concerns regarding the four story minimum height in the MX3 zone. That's the minimum height. There are many, many properties within the MX3 zone that are not physically or economically ready for four story mixed use development today. I believe the PNZ will see a major influx of applications for exceptions to this minimum height, which will clog the overall development application pipelines. I believe that dense, dense mixed use development should be allowed in the new code, but not required to this extent. Next, form restrictions on drive through buildings have been loosened from prior drafts, which I do appreciate, but I still believe they're too strict. And lastly, the code's tighter parking maximums, particularly in that MX3 zone, require more urban dense development than may be feasible today or in the near future. I believe that limited parking development should be allowed in the new code, but again, not required. I'd like to commend Mr. Tim Keen, Ms. Andrea Tuning, and the rest of the staff for their tireless efforts on the zoning code rewrite. Thank you for the opportunity to participate and for consideration of my feedback. Great, thank you. Uh, Nina Schaefer. Okay. Uh, Hillary Vaughn. Jason White. Scott shown her. All right. <laughs> Maybe we have Kara, Kara Lee Troyer, I think is online. She's next, Crystal. Mr. Chair, she should be able to unmute at this time. Hi there, Ms. Troyer, can you hear us? Can you hear me? We can, yes, hello. Okay. Great, hello, so my name is Carolee Troyer and I live at 2660 West Boise Avenue and I'm here to speak in support of the zoning code rewrite. Um, in the past four years here, I have been a student on campus at Boise State University and I wanted to speak from the student perspective of having a lot of friends move out of Boise to get more affordable housing and then have to drive into Boise um, every day to go to their classes and then this this just causes them uh, to have to waste more money on gas and other expenses when they could be living closer to campus. And the amount of students that I've seen that have to do this are those that are supporting themselves throughout college um, and working their way through it. And I think that we need a city that is able to support these students and support the jobs that will be created from um, them living here. So that's all. 
Okay. Thank you. Up next, Catherine McConnell, followed by Andrew Herndon, and then Kyle Hillman. Hi there. Thank you so much for having us here tonight. My name is Catherine McConnell. I live at 515 East Logan Street, and I'm 31 years old. I want to start by thanking the Department of Planning staff for your many years of work to update our city zoning code, as well as the Planning and Zoning Commission's work to carefully consider the proposed changes. I strongly support the zoning code update in its current form, primarily because it will help facilitate the construction of more housing. Increasing Boise's housing stock is an essential element of keeping Boise a city that young people, so those of us in our 30s, 20s, Boise residents who are kids now, for making this a city that we can actually build a life in. I was born just on the road over at Luke's. I grew up here in Boise. I graduated out of the Boise public school system, and I'm enormously grateful that after moving away for college, I was able to come back and afford to build a, a, buy a home here. But I want to emphasize that so many young people in the city that I know cannot afford to buy or even to rent in Boise. I see a huge wealth divide and a huge generational divide in who can afford to live and buy a home here. Young people today do not have the same opportunities that long-term homeowners have had in the past to build household wealth through homeownership. The zoning code updates is, are an important step towards growing the housing stock that we critically need for a broad range of residents from different generations to be able to establish financially stable lives here. I appreciated especially hearing yesterday from Director Keene that it's the planning department's clear intention to evaluate the code as it's rolled out and to make needed changes as we go. From my perspective, none of the concerns that I've heard raised about the code are substantial enough to outweigh our city's pressing need for more housing stock right now. And I'd much prefer that we move forward with the rezone in its current form and then to make any needed adjustments in the future. Finally, I wanna briefly comment on the role that neighborhood associations have played in this public comment process. Yesterday, I heard my neighborhood association, the East End Neighborhood Association, make an argument that they represented all East End neighbors. However, to the best of my knowledge, my neighborhood association did not attempt to solicit any neighbor feedback when developing the testimony that gave. And when myself and several other neighbors attempted to engage with our neighborhood association around the zoning code update, our views were generally disregarded and not reflected at all in our neighborhood association's testimony. So I have no idea whether the way our neighborhood association conducts its business is similar or different from other neighborhood associations, but at least from the standpoint of the East End, I'd really caution the commission from assuming that a neighborhood association genuinely represents the views of all neighbors. So thank you again for your time. I'm really excited about the future that the zoning code update is building and especially opportunities that I think it will create for Boise's younger residents. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew Herndon. And then uh, Kyle Hillman and Michael Auberg. Hi, my name is Andrew Herndon. Uh, I live at 406 South 4th Street, which is an apartment building downtown. I want to start by saying thank you all for your service on this commission and for your time on this proposal. Um, I strongly support the modernization of Boise's zoning code. I think it does a lot of things to help create all sorts of housing for all sorts of different families um, generally. I think the solutions that are in the reform zoning code are thoughtfully created and they make sense for this city. Uh, I appreciate the incentives and compromises that went into place to make sure that there wouldn't be runaway gentrification or displacement of existing locals, uh, which is an important consideration when trying to manage the growth of a city like this. Uh, I do have some concerns about deed restrictions on third and fourth unit uh, housing to make them affordable. Uh, I think that deed restrictions are very powerful and are a useful tool, but as it was mentioned yesterday, I think, um, it would be a very good idea to have some provision for a sunsetting of those deed restrictions, just that you don't accidentally create a permanent two-tier system of land use. Um, I think also one of the neighborhood associations mentioned yesterday a mechanism to cancel a deed restriction if development doesn't actually go through, and I support that idea as well. I think it's a good idea. Um, uh, so as I said before, I live downtown in a rental apartment with my partner. 
We moved to Boise last year uh, after he, uh, who was born and raised here, finished his medical training in Portland and joined a practice here. We chose Boise because his parents live here. And um, we, had an initial, we had an initial home search that we found was surprisingly pretty difficult in that there were not a lot of units that were acceptable or correct at price points that made sense. We even had uh, the listing agents that worked in some of the rental buildings downtown suggest that we'd get a better value if we moved to Meridian, which with all due respect to our neighbors to the West, we didn't want to move to Meridian. We wanted to move to Boise. Um, for, fortunately, we were able to find something that works downtown, but it highlighted that there really is a scarcity of options. And we're pretty easy. We're two adults and a cat. Uh, if you have children, if you're trying to have children, if you're living alone, if you're any sort of other family structure, the number of options can be very, very limited. And I think that that's, that is a problem that will cause people to choose not to live in, Mer in Boise, not even to live in Meridian or Tanampa, and sometimes to just leave the metro area entirely. And that can break up families that have been here for generations, and that can deprive us of needed talent that we need to bring in. Uh, I think that this generally, as a, as a process, this zoning code reform will help to address that. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Kyle Hillman. And then Michael Auberg Aberg, and then Walker Grimshaw. Hello, I'm Kyle Hillman. I live at 311 South Pearl Street, in Boise, Idaho. Um, I graduated with a master's degree from Utah State University in 2019. I landed a wonderful career opportunity in Boise in 2020. I was looking forward to it because I had heard great things about Boise, culture, music, um, outdoors, basically everything I was looking for in a city. And just like the last speaker, once we started looking for a place to live, it did not take long to realize the scarcity and high cost of housing in Boise proper. Finding a rental felt like interviewing for a competitive job offer while simultaneously trying to win an, aux um, an auction. And that really is how it felt. It, we, we, we couldn't find one in, in Boise. We ended up in a Meridian townhome complex on two of the busiest roads in Ada County, which is not what I was looking for. Um, I had graduated with a master's degree, landed a great job here, and I was stuck in a place that made me unhappy. Um, I didn't, it didn't match my value set. Um, I, I value bikeability, walkability, art, and culture, and feeling stuck in that location negatively affected my mental health for those two years. After two significant pay raises and a significant breakup, I was able to afford my own rental near downtown Boise. I've basically given up the pipe dream of home, home ownership in Boise, um, which is pretty sad considering my good education and good job. I'm an account manager for various industries between Twin Falls and Payette managing their water treatment programs. And I believe I add value to those industries that keep people employed in our area. There is a huge demand for Boise and I believe people will keep moving here. I believe the current zoning laws are creating a housing scarcity, which by the simple concept of high demand and low supply has created an unaffordable competitive housing situation in Boise. Boise is nationally famous for its upside down income to housing cost ratio. Um, and the status quo will drive top talent away from Boise, not bring them in. Um, I'm also interested in real estate investment um, on a small scale, like a fourplex that I could buy and live in one unit. Um, but that is incredibly unapproachable in Boise currently. Um, it feels like um, housing scarcity has created an exclusive good old boys club for rental ownership and real estate investment in this, um, in this valley. Eliminating rent, uh, land restrictions um, that make it so that only single family only housing is, is, is the option um, will also make Boise greener and combat urban sprawl. Less people being forced to drive means less pollution, less road congestion, and less traffic accidents. So if it wasn't clear, I do support um, revising the zoning code in Boise. Thank you. Michael Auberg, Walker Grimshaw, and then Eric Kingston. Hello, uh, Michael Aberg, 1516 South Big Street. I come, well, 
I come before you to uh, add my support to the uh, Modern Zoning Code rewrite. You've already heard a lot tonight and you're set to hear a lot more throughout the week. And I would like to start by pointing out the voices that you actually won't hear throughout this process. Testimony from people who are busy working, previous Boise residents who have been priced out and pushed out into the exurbs by the meteoric cost of living increase. And uh, though <laughs> I wrote down by and large young people, even though we've largely been testifying so far. Though I am not the Lorax and I cannot claim to speak for them, I think it's important to consider that everyone who will speak tonight and tomorrow are people fortunate enough to have time off work, time to dedicate to looking into the zoning code, and those whose idea of a good time is showing up for five hours on a Tuesday evening to speak about city zoning. My best friend is an excellent example of this. He can't be here to testify tonight, but he is a nurse at uh, one of the major hospitals in the region, and his income puts him at roughly the 80% AMI bracket. These are the people uh, like nurses, teachers, janitors, baristas, et cetera, who are rapidly being pushed out of the city by the affordability crisis caused by our low density current zoning code. <sighs> he had dreams of someday buying a property in Boise, but now he's planning on leaving the state entirely uh, because he just cannot make up the, the cost difference to purchase a property here. And he has no desire to commute in from the exurbs and join the traffic in the morning on 84. That's where the zoning code rewrite can help by allowing a wider variety of housing to be built, removing some of the arbitrary limits like parking minimums, frontage requirements, lot sizes, etc. We can hopefully establish a lower rung on the property ownership ladder and decrease the barrier to entry. For example, when my parents first brought their property, it was a condominium. When my oldest brother was born, they bought a townhouse. Then they bought a more modest home when my middle brother was born. And then they bought the house I grew up in. Many of our neighborhoods are severely lacking in this variety of housing, while some of our most cherished neighborhoods have it peacefully coexisting within them the whole time. Drive up Harrison Boulevard and you'll see a duplex, cottage court apartment, and apartment complex along one of the most desirable streets in the city. That's not even to speak of some of the joy of some of our neighborhood restaurants. Just this morning, I had breakfast at Addie's at Southeast Boise Village, and I think about the breakaway success of The Still, Push and Pour, and Wild Child on Layton and Alpine. Destinations within our neighborhoods worth walking and biking to that can potentially cut down on inner neighborhood traffic and build a sense of community. I think all of our neighborhoods could use more of that kind of local scale development so that we don't have to always trek to the north end to get a taste of urbanism. Something I heard yesterday that resonated with me is the concept of coming back in a year's time for a wellness check if this passes. It's a good reminder that this is a process, not an end game. What is amended can be amended again. But what's clear is that the status quo is not working and that our best neighborhoods are those that were established before our current zoning codes existed. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Walker Grimshaw. Okay. And then Eric Kingston is online, Crystal. And then after that, Kelly Tag. Uh, hello, my name is Walker Grimshaw and I live at 917 North 10th Street. I am 32 years old. I grew up in Boise and I have loved living here as an adult. I'm here to express my full support for the zoning code update, acknowledging also that it is not perfect. Like most others in this room, I have not read the 600 page document, but have instead gathered information mostly from local journalism and tuning into yesterday's commission meeting. Because of the limitation on my own knowledge of the code update, I'll speak more broadly about the type of city I would like Boise to become and allow the planners and other members of the public to speak to individual details. I want a Boise that is affordable, bikeable, walkable, and sustainable, and recognize that these are all intertwined. I want a Boise that emphasizes affordability for its residents throughout the city. This means not only allowing higher density housing and infill development, but also requirements for affordable housing in new developments. It is my understanding that the development of fourplexes will require that two of the units be rented to low-income residents, and I applaud the city for this, especially in the face of state legislation that prohibits inclusionary zoning. I would encourage the city to move further in this direction with even stronger incentives than those already in the code update. I want a Boise that is bikeable and walkable, not just in the high-income parts of the city, but everywhere. Higher density mixed use areas will allow more people to walk, bike, and hopefully use public transit to get to work, to school, and to play in the parks and foothills that we all hold so dear. Again, higher density is only one piece of the puzzle that needs to be complemented by more separated bike paths, sidewalks, and bike parking instead of vehicle parking. I want a Boise that is environmentally sustainable, that encompasses a lot and is 
addressed in part by increasing density and making the city bikeable and walkable. And I appreciated yesterday's discussion of how to improve reuse and adaptation of existing structures rather than the demolition and rebuilding we are seeing so much across the city now. I asked that the city require water smart construction and landscaping and incentivize xeriscaping. We live in the arid west that is growing ever drier, but you wouldn't know it from the green lawns throughout the Treasure Valley. Lastly, I was happy to hear yesterday that the city plans to revisit the code a year after it is adopted to fix some of its imperfections and continue to improve the code for the benefit of all residents. Acknowledging the time and effort it has taken to develop this code, re this code rewrite, I would encourage the city to put policies in place to update the zoning code on a regular basis so that we continue to design and adapt for the future we want to see instead of going another 60 years working with outdated ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Eric Kingston, staffs online. Okay, and then Kelly Tag, and then Daniel Malarkey. Okay, is this thing on? Yeah, we can hear you. Hello. Fantastic. Um, my name is Eric Kingston. I live at 1010 East Jefferson in the East End. Uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, thank you and the planning staff for your dedication and thoughtful engagement. Uh, this has been a heavy lift, and it's really it's long overdue. I would say the current restrictive density limits are depriving me and others of the benefits of living in a diverse and welcoming community. So I think this, that's why we need to adopt this uh, modern zoning code that gives us more flexibility. I recommend adopting it without delay. It's not perfect, but let's test drive it, see how it handles. I think it's gonna be better than the Edsel we've been driving. Um, I'm a longtime East End res resident, but Ina's testimony yesterday did not reflect my views. My perspective reflects a quarter century running a statewide housing hotline and helping individuals and communities adapt, anticipate and adapt to change. I look at housing as it affects community health and stability, economic opportunity, land use and fair housing. I also teach a class I call housing as a second language at the Northwest Community Development Institute. Here are a few things I've learned along the way. Housing is where jobs go to sleep at night. These jobs are held by the people we rely on every day, but whose voices aren't represented in public hearings. Here's how we make them feel welcome in the community they serve. First, raise wages indefinitely to subsidize real estate speculation, exclusionary zoning, and housing monopolies. This fuels inflation. Two, raise taxes to subsidize employer profits and consumer costs through vouchers and other resources that keep rents low. Three, distribute housing diversity and density throughout all neighborhoods to increase the return on land, labor, infrastructure, and resources. And four, support creative local housing developers that are accountable to our community and keep tenant wages and incomes circulating in our economy. When neighbors consistently reject density and diversity, which is one way to expand housing choices, that means big landlords can push rents up and tenants out. In their SEC filing, Invitation Homes celebrated a housing shortage that lets them keep rents high. They also warned their shareholders that, quote, continuing development will increase the supply of housing and competition for residents. NIMBY is great for their bottom line. Small developers operate on slim margins and can't overcome NIMBY-driven delays and costs. This lets big out-of-state developers with more capacity and lawyers dominate our housing market. We need folks like my neighbor, Greg Ostro, who enjoys the challenge of solving wicked design puzzles. We should demand that same creativity of any developer building in Boise. We don't want them to think that we suffer from premature capitulation. Finally, fair housing law requires Boise to take meaningful actions to address barriers to fair housing choice, like exclusionary zoning. Current zoning restricts diverse housing types, disproportionately impacts marginalized communities, and perpetuates economic segregation. The most significant impacts involve children. Mm -hmm. It's in all our interests to have kids grow up in stable homes in mixed income areas of opportunity. The research is clear. These kids have higher rates of upward mobility as adults, leading to lifetime benefits such as increased earnings, better health, health outcomes, and lower rates of incarceration. And that's a win for all of us. Thank Thanks. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Kingston. That's your time. Appreciate it. Uh, up next, Kelly Tag. Okay. Uh, staff, I see uh, Daniel Malarkey is next. 
I think he's online. And then Christian Moore, Greg Ostro, and Ben Burnham. Very good. Can you hear me? Hi there. We can. Yes. Excellent. Yes. My name is Daniel Malarkey. I live on the depot bench at 3416 Meadow Drive. Um, I'm uh, proud to have been a member of the C Citizens Advisory Committee uh, and part of uh, Neighbors for Boise as well. Um, I'm also a senior fellow at the Sightline Institute, which is a, a regional think tank uh, providing analysis on housing, economic, and environmental policy in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, I want to begin by thanking Tim, Andrea, and really the entire staff uh, for all the work they have done over the last three years, um, engaging, you know, on, on what is a what is a tough, tough and complex issue. Uh, and, and really doing so with a real regard for all the voices that um, are, are part of our community here in Boise. Um, I think that the main point that I wanna make is that I am uh, I support uh, the, the modern zoning code and encourage you to recommend it to the council. Um, and that is even though there are some things, you know, I, I am in the school that wishes it, wishes it went further. Uh, um, I would say it is a modest incremental reform. It's a step in the right direction. But I think as you've already heard from some of the prior speakers that, you know, I would like it better if there were no parking requirements. And uh, I would uh, prefer uh, that we, um, you know, that the minimum lot sizes were even less as they are in, in, in other cities. So um, I think it's important for, I think, the... For you all to know that this is a, a, a modest step. I think it sort of splits the difference between uh, a pure NIMBY, like let's not change anything, and what I would say would be the most uh, aggressive uh, kind of abundant housing policies that one might take and where we can find examples in other cities where they have have, have decided to go further. Um, and so um, I, uh, but I think it's worth passing. Uh, I think it will absolutely help increase the supply of housing of all types for our city. Uh, I think that would be a great change. I have some concerns that won't, it will end up wanting to remove some of the, uh, the constraints that are that remain in the existing code, but knowing that we'll have a chance to revi revisit that in the year and, and really look at you know, how much productivity have we gotten out of the, uh, these changes and do we need to further you know, remove the constraints uh, that were that are, are still embedded in the system. But uh, I thank you for your time and support uh, and, and, and careful consideration of, of this proposal and hope you will uh, recommend it to council. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Uh, Christian Moore. Greg Ostro. Ben Burnham. And then Gary Zimmerman. Hey, all Ben Burnham, 4305 West Fairmont Street, Boise. Also new planning commission podcast fan. So thanks for doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I truly do learn a lot. I'm not a planning person, but I've learned a lot from it. So thanks for doing it. Um, so I'll start by just a little bit of who I am. I'm also in my thirties, as some other folks have stated, I live in the central bench and I'm also on my neighborhood association. And then for work, I supervise custodians all the way up to entry-level professionals, um, generally folks that are not from the treasure Valley. And that's just due to a lack of folks that have been qualified here. And so I say those things because they apply to the testimony that um, I'd like to give today in support of the modern zoning code. The first aspect of this is, that I'd like to support is earlier neighborhood participation and faster project approval. So being on my neighborhood association, I've been to several neighborhood meetings. I would not recommend that to anyone that enjoys like a chill evening. Um, and so part of that that I like with the change is that it would be, we would move that up in the process so that the neighborhood could come along and be heard. And so that ideally they're bought in as we welcome new neighbors to our neighborhoods. A lot of times these projects are coming to us at a time where they're basically settled or they appear to be settled. And that's really difficult for people who've lived in those neighborhoods for a long period of time. And so I think that along with better direction, uh, as the city's mentioned in several of their uh, prior planning meetings would be a great, a great step forward. But I also agree um, to what Tim stated earlier that every single project does not need to be a battle. 
And that's kind of how it's being treated right now. And it's really, really difficult to go through those. Um, my first neighborhood association meeting, there was anti-immigrant sentiment given about a possible afford affordable housing project. Then we learned it was a market rate project, which meant it was too expensive and it was gentrification. So all that to say that a lot of the folks opposing it are just using whatever the particular thing is at these neighborhood meetings to oppose it without actually necessarily putting the thought into why it's change. The next thing is that I supervise low wage workers. And these are full time people. And so, again, some folks that I've mentioned having to move to the suburbs and exurbs, that is exactly what's happening. My folks start at $15 an hour full time. They cannot afford to live in Boise. These are the folks who allow the place that I work to operate. That's not cool. And then we also have young professionals. These are folks with master's degrees. Not that education means anything in that regard, but they also cannot afford to purchase a house in Boise. And they really struggle to live somewhere bikeable, walkable, which again, a lot of folks have noted is what a lot of folks in our generation are looking for. The other items is my housing journey. And this will probably be my last point, but I was fortunate to buy a house in the central bench area right before everything went real bad in 2019. And because of that, I did not grow up wanting to live the suburban single family home lifestyle. I had no options to purchase anything within walking, biking distance from work and downtown. And that's what I think this will do the best of is provide folks like me, other people uh, that are in kind of their starting stage of life um, mm -hmm. and make that available to them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gary Zimmerman. And then Ethan Mansfield, Grant uh, Burgoyne, and Jay Razgorshek. Razgorshek. I believe I have some. Uh, I believe I have some slides. Okay. Thank you. And just use the arrows on this. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to hear everybody today and all the hours you're going to be putting into this and allowing me to testify. Um, my name is Gary Zimmerman. I live at 4375 Plum Street. That's in the up zone. Um, although the zoning code rewrite claims its purpose is to protect the character of residential areas, a study of the over 600 page document clearly shows that the permitted uses will destroy that character in those areas along with one's quiet enjoyment of their own property. The new code deals a double whammy of upzoning plus further zoning permissiveness impacting thousands of owners and their neighbors. I know we heard that wasn't a dramatic change, but for those in that upzone, it's an extremely dramatic change. Now your upzone neighbors could be subdivided into tiny 2,500 square foot lots with 40 foot high buildings next to your single family, single story home, or perhaps a neighborhood cafe serving alcohol next to your children, or possibly a boarding house, food truck, or even a prison release halfway house. And if a cup is required, the new laws allow the city to just say it's for a greater public benefit to get approval. The new code rationalizes this upzoning if it's within an eighth mile of a city defined best in class transit route. But this is, of course, an arbitrary, defini an arbitrary definition. Um, the city's decision on what properties are included in the upzone is inconsistent and apparently ad hoc. This can be clearly seen in the picture on the right, for example, in the area of Staten Alamosa where on the southwest side of state, there are numerous R1 properties within the blue one eighth mile zone, but just one is a purple up zone property. While on the northeast side of state, there are three properties that are starred there that are included, but only partially are in that eighth mile zone. And then numerous properties that are fully within it, but aren't up zoned. The city rationalizes this by saying they were following streets, but that seems a little misleading as it wasn't done on the other side. While the entire R1 to R2 up zone should be shelved, at a minimum, the three-star property should be removed from it. Certainly numerous other up zoned owners and their neighbors are not aware of these potential negative impacts to their properties and neighborhood. 
After all, how could they be as the city has obfuscated these impacts by creating an over 600 page document and refusing to create a difference document. And while the city extols the quantity of public outreach, it really only has consisted of scripted interaction sessions and marketing and trash bills and the like. Why the lack of transparency? Why didn't the city specifically reach out to property owners and neighbors who would be directly impacted by the upzone? Thank you. Thank you. Folks, folks, please, please, thank you. Um, Ethan Mansfield, Grant Burgoyne, and then Jay Razgershek. Okay. Uh, Rob Tiedemann. Yep, please. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Grant Burgoyne. I reside at 2203 Mountain View Drive. I want to thank you for this opportunity to provide you with my thoughts about this proposed zoning code. Um, first of all, I want to say that, you know, I have concerns about the code, but I also agree with many of the comments that were made so far by people who support it. And one of the things you, I think, have to do is decide, and I think the council eventually will have to decide how much work you want to do to get it right versus just kind of weighing it and saying, well, maybe it's 51% what I want, so we'll just do it. Um, what happens with legislation is, as with the last zoning code, which has been effect, in effect for some 60 years, is it'll get passed and it'll last for 60 years. So it's really important to take the time to get the code right. And all of the comments, whether people are for or against this code, all of the comments should be carefully weighed in terms of getting the code right and getting it as right as we can now. We're human. We aren't going to get it 100% right. Everybody recognizes that, but, but it, we, can do, we can do somewhat better, I think. Um, so here are my major concerns. The proposed code strips away notice and due process rights on the type one and type twos that were carefully strengthened over many years by past city councils to protect Boiseans. Um, I think that's a mistake. Um, I think there's some things called Idaho values and Boise values. And among those are you tell your neighbors what's going on. If you're gonna do something to your property, you walk next door and you knock on the door and you say, you know, I'm thinking of doing this. What do you think? That's the way we do business in this town with each other. And that's the way the city should do business with its citizens. Density increases must be carefully planned and calculated with maximum city and neighborhood involvement to assure that they are in balance with quality of life issues. What works on State Street won't necessarily work on Fairview, won't necessarily work on Vista or elsewhere. The community has to be involved with these decisions. It's time consuming, it's difficult, it's hard, it always has been, it always will be. The proposed code is not an environmental document of itself. Though I agree it's not inconsistent with other environmentally specific policies and actions. The idea of shifting how we do transportation, absolutely critical, absolutely important. But we have to recognize that if this is going to take 60 years, that's too long. There's an awful lot we have to do in transportation that goes beyond what we're talking about in this code, and we've got to do it tomorrow, not 10 years from now. We can't just sit back and wait for development to solve the problem. So I have a few other thoughts. I'm out of time. Uh, but those were the things that I thought were important to get across is that this is a difficult project that's got a lot of issues. And I, I don't think we should be afraid to step back and say, let's rethink. That's been done at other levels. It can be done at this level. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jay Razgershek. Okay. 
Okay, uh, Rob Tiedemann. Rob Tiedemann. What's that? And then, <laughs> he's going. And then Hannah too. And then Alexis Pinker, uh, Pickering. Good evening. My name is Rob Tiedemann. I live and work and work at two seventeen North Walnut Street in beautiful Boise, Idaho. Last night, there was much discussion about parking, housing densities, building heights, and participation in the public process. This evening, I wish to speak for the trees. Because you have read testimony provided by the public, I know you have seen my two letters related to the draft City of Boise zoning cone rewrite dated March 31st and June 22nd, 2022. With that testimony, I took you deep into the weeds of the intent, purpose, and language of the Boise River System Ordinance. Tonight, I wish to take a step back and give you perspective. I am a restoration ecologist. My work is largely to put back together the broken pieces and parts of natural landscapes, especially rivers and their floodplains. I'm also one of the principal authors of the Boise River System Ordinance, written over a period of 18 months and passed as ordinance in 1993. It is a durable document that remains useful to present time. The people of Boise, like Vicki Paulson from the League of Women Voters, Barbara Sparrow from the Southeast Neighborhood Association, and Carl Gebhardt, a civil engineer, advocated for passage of the ordinance at public hearings at that time. It was praised by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, touted by then Mayor Dirk Hempthorne, and because of its requirement for a 200-foot setback from the waterline of the river at a flow of 6,500 cubic feet per second, it's largely responsible for the corridors of open space at Spring Meadows, Phase 1 and 2, and Windhoek Island subdivisions and the Harris Ranch community. My purpose in speaking with you tonight is to ask you to ensure that the intent, purpose, and language of the ordinance is faith faithfully transposed into the Boise Zoning Code rewrite. This is perhaps best done by referencing the original ordinance in the new and requiring it to be followed with the amendments mentioned in my two letters of testimony to make it current and part of a modern zoning code for the city of Boise. I am available at your convenience to answer questions related to the intent of the original ordinance and eager to answer technical technical questions related to public health and safety and the ecology of the river. Thank you for your service. Thank you. Uh, up next, Hannah Tu, and then Alexis Pickering, followed by John Seagar, and then Grant Walden. Hi, um, my name is Hannah Tu, and thank you for um, all the work that's been done and for the chance to speak to all of you. Um, I know that some people um, may feel like I'm too young to be up here um, because I don't own a home. Um, so this doesn't really affect me. Um, and I feel really strongly the need to, to come up here and talk about how this really does affect the young people in the area and those who are going to be the future. Um, it's true, I don't own a house. I do live, I forgot to mention my address, um, at 33 South Elm Street in Boise. So in the East End, technically. Um, and I can't own a house um, because it's really, 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 really unaffordable to live here. Um, I work with refugees, um, and I, um, if any of you are familiar with what's going on in our city, housing for affordability is incredibly hard. I worked with a woman recently who, um, her family helped our soldiers in Afghanistan, um, and she helped the military there, and um, her family worked as interpreters there. And um, as she sat across the table crying about the fact that they were never going to be able to afford to live in this area that they had um, family move here years before, um, and now they moved here this year, um, she said, why can't anyone do something about this? This is an opportunity um, now to do something about it. Um, it is not realistic for many people to live in this area, despite the great things that make this place home for many of those people. And maybe you're like, well, 
immigrants shouldn't be coming here anyways, so doesn't matter. I don't care that their family served in Afghanistan in this way. I just don't want those people in my backyard. Well, I have a friend who um, born and raised here in Boise who recently moved because despite the fact that she can afford rent here, um, she, she can't afford rent. She knows she'll never be able to buy a house here. So she said, why would I start my family in the city of Boise as a young graduate, as someone who's engaged and getting married? Why would I start my life here when I could move to somewhere that values how affordable it is and makes it possible for me to raise a family in a space that I can afford to do so without driving 30, 40 minutes for me to get to work. Um, I just want to close with saying that I'm in full support of this. Um, policy is not perfect. Um, and I love the cute homes that I wish I could afford to live in in the East End. They are so great and so wonderful. And I hope that when I read the, um, the policy in the 600 page document that I'm correct in, in seeing that there is opportunity for people to be involved in all stages of this process. Um, I love those areas, but I love the people that I get to work with more. Those people are more important than the houses that I think are cute, um, that I know are people's property and their livelihood and they love it. But I think it's more important that we do something for the people who actually live here. Thank you. Okay. Whoa, Thank you. Whoa, okay. 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 Thank you. Dinner time. Not till seven. Oh, shoot. You get dinner at seven, Mill. I'm do you want to take a quick break? No. Okay. No. All right. Keep going. Okay. Slave driver. Just, all right. I know you're hungry. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. And now, yeah, that's a little bit more than we needed to know right there. All right. We got Alexis Pickering online. <laughs> oh, hi, everyone. Um, hi there. Good evening, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I'm Alexis Pickering. I live at 7772 West Bay Hill Street in Boise. It's also bedtime for my 11th month old, so you might hear him in the background, so apologies in advance. Um, but I wanted to say thank you for your dedication and commitment to this process and the opportunity to testify. As one of your proud ACHD commissioners, I see how Boise's existing zoning code impacts the work that ACHD does in our shared vision of making sure that Boise is a walkable, livable place for all of our residents. And as a Boisean who cares deeply about my neighbors and the future livability of Boise for my little guy, I urge you guys to support the zoning code rewrite. We face an enormous housing crisis and we told the city has to work to address it. And the one thing in particular that I wanted to call out is the uh, Okay. Alexis, sorry, we, we lost you there. Can you? Okay. There we go. Um, thank you. Sorry about that. So okay. I just want to say one example of the common sense solution of the zoning rewrite is the pre-application meeting and just how necessary that is for all of these. <laughs> sorry, guys. Hold on one second. We've got hungry seniors and we've got... Uh... <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's like her tired babies. I know everyone's <laughs> being held up by this guy. Sorry, guys. Um, I just want to say that that pre-application meeting is way overdue. It, we've seen complications with ACHD staff and the city and developers getting caught in the crosshairs and we're not all on the same page. And just that one solution will make so many things easier and reduce costs and complexity that we're seeing in the existing zoning rewrite. So, I hope you support it for a lot of different reasons, but just that one in and of itself is a really big deal. So thank you all. Okay, thank you. Uh, all right, up next, John Segar or Seger? Okay. And then uh, Grant Walden, Gianna Wickham, and then Benjamin Donovan Chaffetz. Chaffetz. Hi, my name's my name's John Seeger. Uh, I live at 3109 South Crossfield Way. Uh, I'm a long-term, long-time resident of Boise. Lived here over 22 years now, and uh, I'm coming out in support of this plan. Uh, I've cut out a bunch of what I said because everybody's had great comments. 
I think the important part for me is that this has been a great process for people. Everybody who's had, who wanted to comment has had ample opportunity to comment in here. Comments have been rolled in. Zoning by definition is trade-offs. And there's tons of trade-offs here. Nobody on either side of this, is, of these, this plan is happy, is totally happy with it. Nobody got what they want. Everybody made compromises. And I appreciate all the hard work that went into that. And that is truly kind of, to me, what Boise is all about. Um, I guess the, the message that I want to leave you with is that I've been here for over 20 years. I've seen how broken our zoning system is. I am not happy with where we are right now, like most people aren't. And we're there in large part because of our zoning process that's broken and needs to be fixed. I'm a retired firefighter. The way I kind of think about this is I've had lots of opportunities in my career where I look up and I see a big problem, a fire, and say, how in the world are we going to deal with that? Well, the process we do is very simple. You come up with a plan. It doesn't have to be a perfect plan, but it has to be a plan. And you come up with it, you get input, you put together a plan, and then you go do it. Because if you try to get to a perfect plan, you're just sitting there looking up at the fire, watching it get bigger and bigger and bigger. The problems keep getting bigger and bigger, and you never get it done. You guys are really close now. It's not perfect, but this is a great plan. I hope you move it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Grant Walden, and then uh, Jana or Yana Wickham, Benjamin Donovan Chiefitz, and then Janet Burke. Grant Walden, 3310 North Mountain View Drive in Boise. I moved here in 1989. The phrase you hear when you move to Boise is don't change Idaho, have Idaho change you. If approved, this rezone of Boise will permanently change Idaho and Boise. Boise has approximately 235,000 residents and 100 residential units. With this zoning change, these numbers will go up. Is that a good thing? I don't know. Do we need to keep up with the other cities in Idaho? Seems like that's what they want to do. I live in a mature, built-out neighborhood in West Boise. It's one thing to add a mother-in-law quarters to a lot. It's a way different thing with this code allowing 25 foot wide lots that will change neighborhoods forever. With this new zoning, one lot could go from one unit to four. And in my neighborhood, I don't think there's enough utilities of water, sewer, electricity, internet available in these older neighborhoods to support these things. These changes will make my quality of life and every neighbor worse. With this new density with the rezone, city services like police, fire, parks are only going to go up. And that's going to make my taxes go up for me and my neighbors with really no benefit. Another thing when you're with this rezone is you're going to be creating neighborhoods strife by pitting neighborhood, neighbor against neighbor, punishing those who created a nice city by jamming small homes next to large lots, creating disharmony. That is not what Boise is. We like quiet, beautiful, safe, tree-lined neighborhoods, especially those on the bench, South Boise and Northwest Boise. This ordinance really protects the North End and will ruin a lot of other beautiful neighborhoods. Atlanta is a failed city. Let's not turn Boise into Atlanta. I ask you to vote to deny this rezone and leave, leave Boise like it is. Remember, don't change Boise. Have Boise change you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jenna Wickham, Benjamin Donovan Chiefitz, Janet Burke, and Kathy Corliss. Hi, my name is Jana Wickham. I live on Prince Street in Northwest Boise. I am a native Idahoan. I was born in Twin Falls and grew up in Boise. I graduated from Bora High School in 1966. I am a retired realtor from Carmel and Pebble Beach in California. 
I am now retired in my hometown of Boise. I oppose the rezoning of Boise for the following reasons. Number one, it's illegal. When Idaho residents consider purchasing property in Ada County, they consider and rely on the general plan of zoning codes in place at the time. It is a contract between the homeowner and Boise City Council. To unilaterally change a contract between two parties is illegal in standard law. Loss of capital. When vacant land zoned residential is suddenly rezoned to commercial or high density, a loss occurs to the surrounding neighborhoods. Lower appreciation and value of their property. Higher density traffic, higher noise volume, loss of neighborhood quiet. And in the rezoning, there is no representation for the residents to oppose the rezone at the time. There is no requirement for a public hearing or vote. There are remedies. I propose that a vote should be required to be taken from the homeowners within a radius of 10 miles around the property for every proposed rezone or a general vote required from the public. Anyway, I appreciate all the effort you've put into this, but I oppose the new rezoning. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Donovan Chavitz. Okay. Oh. Uh, Janet Burke. And Kathy Corliss. And then Jackie Davidson. Hi, my name is Janet, uh, 713 West Elwood Drive. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify against the modern zoning code. I'm here today as an Idahoan for over 30 years, representing myself and my husband, who was born and raised an Idahoan. We've been content East Enders for the last 17 years up until the last three years or so. We've witnessed our city in serious decline, fighting to keep Boise, Boise. <coughs> Locking the city down, making people wear masks, ruining the morale and stigma of our police officers. <clears throat> and um, now this one last attempt to try to control the people of Boise by changing the planning and zoning code that has worked for decades. If this was such a, a good plan for the people, you'd be shouting it from the rooftops. But instead, you decide to try to slide it through without clarity. I wonder if you really even understand the 611 page modern zoning code manual that uh, AI may have copied or created for you. We've seen your true colors of dystopia that doesn't match the character or environment that Boise has to offer. Understand our position because we certainly understand yours. We would like you to stop spending the, the city's money on frivolous BS and start spending money on what really matters, the heart of Boise. You need to prove to the people the dire necessity to change the current code, justify the stats of people dying to move to Boise with no place to live. Show me forecasts of people shoving their way in with no place to live. Maybe you can't do that because people can't afford to uh, move here because of the debt to income ratio. The modern zoning code is not the solution for Boise's homeless or the people in poverty desperately looking for housing. And if this was a solution, your corporate investors and developers would already be housing them as we speak. Tear it all down and start with the basics. Take care of those in need. It's a safe assumption to go the easier route and follow humble, original Boiseans. Do the noble and prosperous thing the city of trees once had, community and unity. Admit your self-preservation so Boise can go on being free at liberty to make choices for themselves. 
remember your oath. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, folks, we got it. We got it. Stop the clapping, please. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Corliss. Okay. Uh, Jackie, Jackie Davidson. Okay. Roger Bomchin. Bum, Bumchin. Okay. And then uh, Kristen Bumchin, Janelle Holt, and uh, Teresa Vincent. <clears throat> My name is Roger Bomchin. I'm a retired building official. I worked for the city of Nampa for 17 years. So I'm pretty familiar with codes. I was checking you guys out uh, on this uh, thing. Uh, what we did is we moved here uh, uh, six years ago, retired from uh, from there, and, and uh, we moved to the East End at 2, 224 uh, North Hot Springs Drive. So we're just off of Warm Springs there by the M&W Market. We have a lot of things that people want there where we live. It's a, it's a wonderful single-family dwelling. Uh, all our neighbors, single-family dwellings, uh, we can walk to the market. We easy to walk around down to the green belt, to the golf course. I can go into the park, to to the botanical gardens, ride our bikes into town. It's a lovely place, and I feel like uh, it's a great place to be. And we're really happy to be here. But I was looking at the, the zoning, and I see it's. I feel like it's being it's targeting the R one C, and that's what our subdivision is. The R one C has a, uh, you know, has the smallest lots already of all, you know, from the R1A, R1B, R1C. And we really, really, it's tough to think that as close as we are to our neighbors now that we could be diminished and subdivided. Um, at the moment, you know, the R1As, you know, they're the wealthier, bigger lots. They, they get, they get 20,000 square foot as a minimum lot. Uh, RB, 1Bs get 9,000. Uh, the R1Cs get 3,500, according to the last time I saw the change that are going to be made. So that's three, that's, that's pretty small. And also what they've done is they've raised our maximum height. Now we have a single story home and I remodeled it and, and, uh, and uh, added on. I kept it at one story because everyone in, on my block is one story house. And uh, they, in most houses in our in our blocks are about 16 to 18 feet to the height of our so we have neighbors all very copacetic so the new code says that in r1c we could have three story buildings 40 feet high so that means old joe who lives next to me is 92 years old and he dies he could sell it to a to an investor or a developer they could use the incentive clauses and put in a couple fourplexes that are 40 feet tall right next to in our backyard where we have we have a hot tub we have a nice place patio to enjoy our evenings and, and lifestyle that we have so i feel like even though you guys have some really good ideas with developing maybe new areas and making it find affordable housing for people and all that to come into an existing neighborhood where we've been there for 75 years and to we haven't been there 75 years the neighborhood has been and has enjoyed that zoning that to suddenly change it uh it's a bit harsh and so what we'd really like to see is maybe we could exempt some neighborhoods maybe the okay. east end could be i'm sorry you're over your time that would be great okay thank you Hello, my name is Kristen Bomshin, and I live at 224 Hot Springs Drive. And I want to thank you for your service and for your time here this evening, listening to all of us. Okay, I live in the newer East End neighborhood, which is 75 years old. Our lots are small, the neighborhood is full, and the streets are lined with parked cars every night. I understand the planning and zoning has devoted much time to this rezone process, but I admit I did not hear about it until I received an insert in our power bill. 
which referenced this upcoming rezone. The photos in the insert were lovely. It was open space, two little girls playing in the park, cute little cottages. Then I learned that this zone change would easily allow a five unit, 40 foot tall complex in our old neighborhood with less than half the necessary parking. We all have cars. We're not giving them up just because the parking isn't there. Your website, Planning and Zoning, says this modern code will protect the character of our unique neighborhoods and create opportunities for small businesses, pathways, and homes at Boise prices. I don't know what that means. Across our city so that our kids can return home to start their lives in places they grew up. But this rezone proposal smacks of pro-development for the benefit of developers and investors. It does not benefit our unique neighborhoods and our kids can return only if they are willing to be long-term renters in some multiplex owned by who knows who. Our neighborhood associations are not in favor of the rezone in its current form. Who was being asked if our associations weren't supporting the proposals with these rewrites? The mayor has recently appointed two city council members. These were not elected by the people of Boise. This is not citizen representation. Only elected members should have the power to determine the people's fate and changing the face of our old and established neighborhoods is affecting our fate. This drastic zone change that has the potential to create such upheaval should be decided by the people or at least the representatives of the people. These rezones would be lovely in new areas developed in Boise. Uh, there are some great ideas in making the neighborhoods walker and bike friendly with shops close by, but shoving multi-unit giants into old and established single family neighborhoods just sounds bad. So many neighborhoods in the bench are excellent examples of what this rezone will create. Lovely old homes in between giant gray boxes, providing a place for 20 or so people who are paying uncontrolled rent to somebody. At least they have parking. I am opposed to the rezone as it affects these established neighborhoods. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Janelle Holt, uh, Teresa, Vincent, and then Scott uh, Pietsch. Uh, good evening. Thank you for your public service and for taking our comments this evening. My name is Janelle Holt. I live at 616 North Bacon Drive, and I'm an Idaho native. I would like to address the issue of affordable housing. The UpZone has been highly marketed as a solution to the affordable housing crisis in Boise. Promoting it in this way is at best naive and at worst just plain false. Statistics show that the majority, 77%, of residents in need of affordable housing are those who earn 80% of the median income for Boiseans. The upzone will not result in affordable housing for this group. The largest targeted group, R1C, will only provide a small number of dwellings for those making 120% of Boise's median income. A 240-foot studio in my R1C neighborhood rents for $1,100 a month. That's 240 square feet, $1,100. There is no way that new development will be affordable to those who need it in a neighborhood like mine. Pitching the upzone as a solution to affordable, affordable housing is nothing more than marketing spin. Making changes to a code anywhere will not address the deeper issues that have, creating the, ha, that have created this housing crisis here and elsewhere in the country and the world. If high density housing resulted in affordable, affordability, apartments in Boise would now be affordable, and we all know they are not. New construction is naturally more expensive to rent than existing apartments, yet another reason that this plant will not result in affordable places for people to live. The upzone creates losers based on home address. The big winners are the absentee investors and developers who have no connection to the neighborhoods they exploit. I ask you to save Boise's established neighborhoods and reject this upzone, especially in light of the fact that our city council does not democratically represent Boise citizens. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
uh, Teresa Vincent, Scott Pete Piesch, and then Aaron Piesch, and then Mike McNamara. Uh, hello, um, yeah. my name is Teresa Vincent. I live on 1116 East Hayes. I wanna thank you for letting me speak tonight. Um, I am against the proposed zoning code rewrite for a number of reasons. Parking is already an issue, congestion, and also the undemocratic process that is being used to make this change. But the one I wanted—the one I want to talk about today—is the negative impact this upzoning will have on our tree canopy and open green spaces in our neighborhoods. Our trees, for which the city is named, absorb CO2, provide natural habitat for many animals, and mitigate climate stress. We are experiencing hotter and hotter summer temperatures. And we need our established large trees to combat extreme temperatures and add to community health. The new code, which I believe requires two saplings to be planted per development, will not compare to the impact that an established 50-year-old tree would have on our environment. What are the guidelines as to how many trees and which trees could be removed in this process? This development and growth will raise the temperature lower lower and lower diversity in habitat due to the loss of trees. Uh, this short-sighted land, gra land grab, uh, most likely perpetrated by out-of-state investors, prioritizes profit over people and growth and development over quality of life for not only this generation, but also our children's and grandchildren's. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're gonna get close to our dinner break. We're gonna do Scott Piesch and then- They're not here. Not here, okay. Um, sorry, who are you? <laughs> well, um, somehow Michael McNamara's name got on here, but I'm his wife. Oh, okay. And all we right. all know that all wives talk for their husbands. Indeed. Okay. We do know that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Hello. So Mrs. McNamara, if you can start with your name and address, please. It is. Okay. Uh, my name is Melissa McNamara, uh, 1422 East State Street. I am an Idaho native. And I'm here to express some of my concerns regarding the zoning code rewrite. New development standards will destabilize existing neighborhoods. Reducing lot sizes in R1C and R2 encourages lot splits and incompatible infill much denser than existing neighborhoods, destabilizing them and breaking faith with neighbors who believe the neighborhoods they were buying into were stable. Many of these areas are in parts of the city designated as stable neighborhoods in Blueprint Boise. Raising the height limit in residential zones will radically change the character of neighborhoods, reducing privacy, sunlight, and vegetation, including our beloved trees for which Boise is so well known. Increasing housing density in the neighborhoods will contribute to increased congestion, traffic, on-street parking, and create safety hazards for children, and individuals with accessibility limitations. Changes to the Boise City Zoning Code should be written to protect neighbors rather than to destabilize their neighborhoods. Even in my East End neighborhood, which is an historic district, the rewrite re can encourage higher density units with modern designs to replace a demolished non-contributing home. This will negatively impact existing homes and will damage the historic character of neighborhoods like mine. Please consider us taxpaying citizens who want our homes and our neighborhoods to retain the charm and value that led us to live here in the first place. Thank you for your time and for your public service. Thank you. Okay, folks, um, we're going to break for dinner uh, for half an hour, staff, correct? Okay, so we'll, we will be back at 730. Thank you. All right, folks, welcome back. Staff, we're good to press on. Okay, we're getting thumbs up from staff. Okay, folks, we'll continue with our sign up list in the order we've been proceeding in. Um, nice job keeping to our three minute time. Well done. Let's keep that up. Um, but just real quick, I got to address the cheering and the clapping. Uh, we really need to put a stop to that, please, both for and against. We're really here to take in comments uh, and listen under, and understand, but the uh, the clapping and the cheering really has to stop. Uh, we do have security keeping an eye on things. So if that continues, uh, we will um, stop the meeting and have to remove folks, okay? And we don't wanna do that. All right, with that, we'll get back into our list here. 
Uh, let's see. Up first, Susan uh, Gem Gemperly Abdo. Great. Yep, please. And then Roberta D'Amico and Don Essig. Hi, I'm Susan Gemperly Abdo. I live at 801 East Crestline Drive in Boise. And I want to thank you, um, commissioners and the planning staff, for all your time, effort, and life energy that has gone into this. This is a huge job. Um, I also want to say I'm in favor of the new zoning code. I might be a little bit of an anomaly because I'm a, an older person that's in favor. It's, my perception was that it was mostly young people that were in favor and older people that were opposed to much of the code. I'm going to comment today on a section for the in the wildland urban interface overlay, which no one has really talked about yet. Specifically, um, it's page 123 of the draft code. I currently reside in the Boise Heights Neighborhood Association in the WUI, and we've been a certified Firewise neighborhood since 2018. Every summer through fall, all neighborhoods in the WUI, they fear the, the and wildfire threat. We don't want to be a paradise California. Um, the WUI overlay district draft code is definitely a positive step forward in the code. However, there could be some improvements. One area of fencing, it states that a solid six foot fence is required in backyard open spaces where it's undeveloped. This section of code should be removed. First of all, Foothills homes mostly don't even have fences or they have metal fences that you can see through. The reason that we moved to this, these areas is so we could have a symbiotic relationship with nature and with pets. Having a six foot solid fence does several things. It impedes the natural wild, wildlife movement. It disrupts views and the symbiotic relationship that the neighborhood has with nature. And it also creates an unsightly city backdrop. Imagine a sea of fences and imagine in 20 years, a sea of dilapidated fences. So we ask that that be removed. Also, any fencing installed in the WUI area should be non-combustible fencing, definitely not a solid fence and definitely not a wood fence. The other thing is lighting. Um, adding a section concerning outdoor lighting in the WUI overlay district would be really improve the code. Um, a section on much stricter dark sky lighting for both homes and street lights would really improve the code and should be added. Um, this is particularly needed for wildlife health as well as preserving that little bit of dark sky that we still have in Boise. Our neighborhood had a situation with the developer where he installed historic street, street type lamps. Well, they were like car lights shining down Time. and up on neighbors. And um, so anyways, I ask that you add that to the, to the code. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Roberta D'Amico, then Don Essig, Mitchell Lee, and Annie Black. Hope you have cushy chairs up there. All right. <laughs> Good evening and hello, Commissioner, Sh uh, Chairman Schaefer and Commission members. Um, my name is Roberta D'Amico. My address is 3109 South Crossville Way. I've lived there for over 20 years. Thank you for your service on the commission and uh, the, all the time that's being taken this week for our comments. There was a lot of good discussion last night about the challenges we face in Boise, and that's the reason I support the zoning code rewrite. Tonight, I'll focus briefly on three things, housing, sustainability, and the need to address zoning now. Housing. We need more housing for our essential workers within the city that is affordable, available, and within a reasonable distance to their work site. About three years ago, I had a health challenge which involved regular medical visits and rehab for a long while. When you're a regular, you get to know the staff. I was astounded as to how many of the staff were visiting, i.e. contractors from out of state, living in hotels to fill the staffing need. I would learn from them that they want to live here 
yet they could not afford to. We need more housing at various price points um, for our essential workers, whether they are hospital staff in education, law enforcement, fire, basically every single essential worker from the barista to the bartender or whoever, many of which I know would like to be here this evening. It's crazy for people to commute for miles or live out of state to perform jobs in Boise. The zoning rewrite is not the silver bullet for the housing need, yet it will help us meet this need. Sustainability. As an advocate for environmental sustainability, reducing length in commutes is essential. More sprawl means more traffic congestion, more pollution, and likely more vehicle, pedestrian, and bike accidents. We need to connect with the existing roads and infrastructure and the rewrite facilitates this. We need to address the zoning code now. I was a member of the Citizen Advisory Committee for the rewrite. The need to rewrite the code was identified well before we started in the fall of 2020. It's been a long process, intense at times with lots of committee meetings as well as public meetings, which I quietly attended to listen, to listen to my neighbors in Boise. I also wanna shout out to the staff of planning and zoning, um, it was intense, so kudos to them. The idea of extending the comment period concerns me because we need to update the code. In fact, it's probably 20 or 30 years overdue. What happens if we don't update the code? We'll face more sprawl, more infrastructure issues, and even more frustration amongst our residents. Last night, Director Keene noted that modifications can be made in the future. I think it's been referenced as wellness checks. The commissioner, one of you, forgive me as to who said it, asked a neighborhood association representative about running the experiment. At the last citizen advisory meeting, I asked a similar question to the tune of how do we modify what I call glitches or wellness checks. We can fix the glitches only if we implement the plan. With that, I'll close. Um, I support the code. I thank you very much. It's not a perfect plan, but we need to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Don Essig, Mitchell Lee, Annie Black, Daniel Hutchinson. Good evening. Thank you for this opportunity. <laughs> I'm Don Essig. I reside at 615 East Crestline Drive in the Boise Heights neighborhood. A rewrite of the city of Boise zoning code is long overdue. I applaud the current effort to modernize the code and commend the city's planning staff for the three year long effort to engage the public. In my opinion, it's been outstanding. Um, I haven't taken full advantage of the opportunities, but they've been there. Um, the current code is not perfect. And there are a few areas I will speak to in more detail in a little bit. But a new code need not be perfect or please everyone to be a major step forward. So I'm here tonight to urge you to take that step forward now, not later. Um, three areas for improvement. Um, you heard from Susan, fencing in the wildland urban interface. The current code requires a six foot solid fence in the wildland urban interface. Um, that's ridiculous if you ask me. A six foot high solid fencing will impede wildlife movement. And if it's made of wood, it will present a fire hazard. Such fences should not be a requirement of the code in that wildland urban interface. Outdoor lighting. Um, the outdoor lighting should be energy efficient, preserve dark skies and not light up your neighbor's bedroom. I think the current code is admirable and capturing these principles. However, I believe the code could do more to incentivize motion sensing lights to maximize both energy savings and dark sky preservation. Um, CUP conditions. Um, trails and other public amenities and new development should be required to be built at the time the first residents are there for their use. Early residents should not have to wait for build out to enjoy such benefits. Um, waiting years or even decades if a developer chooses to drag their feet is unconscionable. And my neighborhood, we have a cup condition that's been hanging around for 25 years to build a trail that still is not there. Um, so I'm asking that cup conditions be required to meet sooner, not later, um, after the last house is built or maybe not at all. Um, the new code must be clear and direct about this. I suggest adding language that require all cup conditions to be met in time for the first resident. Um, 
such a practice um, in Dry Creek Ranch may have actually saved a life um, recently with a, a story I think you've heard from earlier in testimony yesterday. But even if not, it's what residents deserve. They should come to that community. The amenities that they were promised should be there, even for the first resident. Um, one last parting comment, um, enforcement. The code must be enforceable and enforced, otherwise it's merely words on paper and good intentions may turn into, well, a quarter century wait for a cup condition. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mitchell Lee. Annie Black. Uh, then Daniel Hutchinson and Dave Morris. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Annie Black. I reside at 610 North Walnut Street. Wow, this is a huge thing to try to consume as um, a resident who cares a lot about neighbors, neighborhoods, character, density. I do actually support the ideas of infill affordability and sustainability. And for that reason, I thought this thing was rolling along in a way that made it, would probably make a lot of sense to me. I apologize for not getting involved in the details earlier, but I decided that when the whole thing came out, I'd just double check my thinking and go, and I did that by going to my local neighborhood association meeting. There, I started to learn how complex this is and how likely it is that this essentially is my notification that my neighbor can do all kinds of things that either he or she could have done yesterday and I didn't know it in the current code or perhaps new things that uh, weren't, aren't allowed in the current code. So I thought I'll go to work and try to figure this out. Well, I can't find summary tables on what was current and what's uh, maybe in a past draft and what's in an existing draft on some really basic things. Now for the intention of my testimony, which is not to ignore the importance of many other districts, I'm focused on R1C because it's what I'm most familiar with, but I don't know how to understand current to October to February on things like lot. And then in addition, I'll go into specifics of what I don't entirely understand. But in addition, I don't know where to find a really good summary of, hey, this is what a residential lot is. This is what a small lot is. This is why they're different. I know that staff has worked extremely hard, and I know I've, they've done a ton of outreach, so perhaps it's my fault. But if I come to the game late, I can't find a, a fairly easy document to go through. Maybe, I mean, I did go through the 30-page staff summary but it doesn't really address what's going to happen either next door to me or next door to my old best friend in a totally different neighborhood that I lived in 10 years ago. So I was, um, I wanted to just tell you that from my perspective, to the extent I've been able to figure some of this out, the devil really is in the details. And there are just a few details that I'll bring to bear that I think are relevant for Oh, I'm almost out of time. So I think they're really most relevant for those of us who are shockingly confused at this point. What about floor air area ratio and its relationship to open space? I think I can do a single dwelling home with no attention to any of that. And perhaps even now a duplex, it's because it, apparently it was struck. And in that case, I could actually build a couple really, really expensive houses. Um, which is nothing to do with affordability. It's actually the opposite. So I'm very concerned about that. I'll also tell you, I'm really concerned about transitions. So I will try to put together testimony for council, but I don't think there's a good way for us to understand what's going on with transitions. There's something about small lots, but not about regular lots. So that's where okay. I stand. Great, thank you. Uh, Daniel Hutch Hutchison. Dave Morris, Diana Lanciando. Uh, good evening. My name is Dan Daniel Hutchison. Live reside at 102 North Jantoni uh, Drive here in Boise, Idaho. Been a Boise resident for um, approximately 40 years. Over the last uh, 50 some years, I've had the opportunity to work professionally uh, on the federal level 
writing, reviewing, and responding to public comment on land use plans, uh, environmental statements, and federal uh, regulations. Based on my experience and what worked well on the public review and comment period, a project of this complexity would have required a minimum of 180 days for public comment and understanding if the public was provided adequate detailed information on the development of the plan. Anything less than that results in many years of litigation and fights over the outcome as nobody involved in the process is uh, satisfied uh, with the outcome. Now for tonight's purposes, I find that three minutes to make a presentation on such a poorly written 160 or 611 page document is totally inadequate to provide for any sort of meaningful input in the process. I'm requesting that the commission delay any further discussion and divert it to public input and public coordination until after the new city council is seated in January. Uh, the public has been extensively excluded from this process, even though we've heard many comments on how much the public has been involved. But when a document is released 56 days ago, a few hours before the first day of March, and is portrayed as a February release of the document, it's fairly insulting to the, the community. Normally, I would follow the established protocols that I used for 50 years of making a well thought out comment, being respectful of uh, the audience. But you, go, you folks opened the door to a more critical, honest evaluation or critique of this process when you disparaged or discounted this public input last night prior to hearing or sitting to listening to any of it. I want you to know that I find it extremely insulting to use derogatory terms like newbie or whatever other derogatory term you use for us in your private conversations, and those should not be used within public discourse. I'm very disgusted with the happy talk that is being used to disguise the true meaning or true outcome of this uh, planning effort. Uh, I do have to say that this is, of all the documents I saw in over 50 years of working on public documents, this is the least or the poorest document I've ever seen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dave Morris. Diana Lachiando. And then Elizabeth Norton and Lori Dicare, Dicare. Here. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioners. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today. My name is Diana Lachiando. I was born and raised here in Boise, and I'm a fourth generation Idahoan. Um, I'd prefer not to state my home address, but would be happy to give it to your staff. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here in support of an updated modern zoning code. I'd like to discuss this from a couple different angles. So, first, let's talk about the math. As someone who's sat in your seat, uh, not exactly here in Boise, but up on the dais in local government for both budgetary purposes and planning and zoning hearings, it's important to understand the interplay of these two issues. This zoning code has been updated mindfully with the support and consultation of city staff who understand municipal economics. And I'm gonna get to why that's important in a minute because that hasn't always been the case. Thoughtful density has the potential to lower the operational and capital costs for fire protection, streets and highways, parks and recreation, sewer, solid waste management, and water. Zoning for walkable, bikeable, relatively dense neighborhoods means that the tax base is there to pay for the amenities and necessities that Boiseans want and need. Not only is this fiscally responsible, it makes for better communities. I'd like to share my own background as an example. So in 1980, the year I was born, my parents moved out to a new development on the corner of Maple Grove and Franklin. This was before the mall came in in 1988. And if you really wanna give your street cred in Boise, talk about West Boise before the mall. Um, we, they were told by the developer that parks and bike infrastructure would be coming soon. As a child and teen, there really wasn't much to do in our area. There was no nearby park or library 
And even when the mall came in, the lack of focus on bike and pedestrian infrastructure meant that my parents never allowed us to go there except by car. In fact, the only neighborhood commercial, if you can call it that, was the nearby Maverick gas station, which I believe is now a tobacco shop. And we had to cross four lanes of busy traffic to get there. Simply put, our neighborhood was not zoned for any kind of walkable, bikeable infrastructure um, that I now, living in a different area of the city, want for my kids. So let's flash forward. When I left for college in 1998, no regional park had been built in that area. In fact, the city couldn't afford to develop Molnar Park until 2017. So for those of you doing the math, that is 37 years after my parents moved there. The, ex the zoning that existed when that area was developed in West Boise simply couldn't develop the infrastructure um, that Boiseans are telling you they want and need. Parks, bikeways, et cetera. I share this story because this modern updated zoning code solves for both those issues. By allowing for moderate density and placing a, uh, a premium on connectivity, it will ensure that neighborhoods are more connected to amenities and that local governments have adequate funding to support them. Time. Finally, I'd like to thank you for your time and service on the commission. It is unsung and thankless role and a volunteer one. I appreciate your willingness to dive into these issues. Thanks. Uh, next, Elizabeth Norton, Lori Dyker, Duan Miller, and Larry Alder. No one? Okay. Yeah, I thought, yeah, yeah. Okay, there she is, okay, sorry. Yeah. Laurie DeCare, 7154 West State Street. Uh, the goal of a new zoning code should be that the new code leverages the explosive growth we are experiencing as more ec economically, a more equitable, environmental, sustainable, and economically prosperous city. The zoning code as written falls short on every measure. Simply unleashing the forces of the market by promoting more density through upzoning without guardrails will only lead to more displacement, higher housing costs, more inequality, and vast human suffering in our community. There is no acknowledgement of the huge windfall of value to speculators and investors of the significant upzone contained within the proposed zoning code. The upzone greenlights large private equity backed corporate developers influx into Boise to buy up homes for redevelopment and conversion to rental properties. That is fact. If the city was approaching this process from a position of equity, they would insist on partially capturing this increase in value for affordable housing construction and public amenities at scale. The city should recognize the land lift that occurs when land is rezoned for more density, demanding developers include incomes restricted units in all buildings over a certain size to be able to even approach the vision of a mixed income community, charge a land lift fee. Instead, at the 11th hour, the city threw some totally voluntary incentives for affordability. Despite what you have heard tonight, there are no affordability mandates, which means that not even one unit of income restricted housing will get built. We don't have to just conjecture that the development industry will be unwilling to sacrifice profits voluntarily to help the city with this affordability crisis. We already know, given the city's experience with the housing bonus ordinance passed in December 2020, even with the wholly inadequate affordability standard set at 100% AMI, we know that only over three years, only four developments even utilized it, and two were the city that itself. Our current takeaways from the city's experiment with voluntarily, voluntary affordability incentives is not good. Developers aren't willing to trade their extreme profit opportunity. It's not even an affordability solution if there is little to no participation by developers. The devil is in the details. Anything higher than 80% AMI is fake affordability. As the city's own housing needs assessment states, the zero to 60% AMI is the market most underserved by the profit-driven market price development industry. And those are the people who are being displaced at the highest rate. It is this population that needs the intervention of the municipality to get anything affordable for them built. This is not it. The city's affordability incentives are incredibly too little and too limited. While the city makes moves to trade away the ability to negotiate on a case-by-case -case basis with each developer asking for an upzone cut variance, et cetera, for something in the public good, 
like real affordability or public trail forever, we should at least recognize what a long-term loss this will be as the zoning code rewrite genie won't ever be able to put, be put in the ba back in the bottle and developers will sue for takings if future city leaders even wanted to scale it back. And as usual, the city is selling itself and its legal authority, and by extension, desperate Boiseans clamoring for real affordability short. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dewan Miller, Larry Alder, and then Christina Bruce Benyon. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Dewan Miller. I'm the real estate manager for Lamar Advertising of Boise. Our address is 2250 Empire Way, Boise, Idaho, 83709. I'm here to add some verbal testimony to our written testimony that was previously submitted and part of the record. Um, our primary concern with the zoning code rewrite is with section 11-4-12.9 dealing with off-premise signs. Uh, I know that's not a hot topic of discussion tonight, but uh, nevertheless has a big impact to our business, mm -hmm. um, our local advertisers and clients. Most concerning is the section related to the proposed changes to dwell times for electronic message displays, EMDs, or digital signs as I will refer to them. The planning department has proposed to change the minimum dwell time for digital signs from eight seconds to 20 seconds. We're asking you to keep the current dwell time as it stands for digital signs at eight seconds, which is the industry standard and matches the Idaho state code and all other cities in the state of Idaho where we maintain and operate our digital signs. <clears throat> we do not see the need for this proposed change as our digital signs closely resemble our static sign faces with the exception that our digital displays utilize LED technology and a sophisticated copy change from one ad to the next. Typically, there are up to six different adver advertisers sharing the digital display at one time. We did put together a brief video of two of our digital signs located here in Boise so that you could see exactly what our digital signs uh, look like operating in the real world during the daytime and at night. Uh, please forgive me for the pixelation in that daytime video. If any of you have ever taken video with the TV screen in the background, you know it doesn't really look like that in the real life. As you can clearly see, our digital signs are not scrolling, flashing, or animated in any way. Uh, it is no brighter than the static billboards in the background. We feel that this proposed change to the dwell time is unnecessary and will only hurt our local advertisers and the charitable organizations that Lamar supports. For these reasons and the reasons provided in our written testimony, we are asking you to keep the city's minimum dwell time of EMDs or electronic message displays at the current rate of eight seconds. Thank you all for your time, your attention, and for your consideration of our concerns this evening. We do appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, next, Larry Alder, okay. and then Christina Bruce Benyon, and then Christy Warhurst. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time and your service. My name is Larry Alder. I'm the general manager of Lamar Outdoor Advertising of Idaho. Uh, at 2250 Empire Way here in Boise. In my 24 years as general manager in this market, our intention has always been to work with municipalities that we operate our business in. Boise has been no exception. So it is concerning that not only were we not asked to be involved in the conversation about the zoning rewrite as it relates to digital technologies, there wasn't anyone from our industry that was included or involved in the process. First and foremost, on-premise signs and off-premise signs, digital or static, have separate designations within the Boise City Code. The digital aspect of both sign types are operated completely differently from one another and have far different capabilities. Digital or static, they are two distinctly different sign types and should not be regulated or governed 
by the same rules. For this reason, we oppose the following proposed change to section 11-04-12.9, dealing with the off-premise signs, specifically digitals or EMDs. The dwell time changing from eight seconds to 20 seconds is, is not as unnecessary. As you can see from the video, these are not scrolling, texting, flashing, animated billboard, digital billboards. It's a static image that is a subtle copy change from one ad to the next. There are uh, 41 states that allow and regulate EMDs throughout the country. Uh, the average dwell time is eight seconds. Um, further supporting our position that eight seconds is not only adequate, but is the norm. The proposed dwell time of 20 seconds will not only limit opportunities for local businesses to advertise, it will significantly limit our ability to support local chari charitable organizations throughout the Valley. Commissioners, I appreciate your consideration and the concern of the concerns that we have regarding this proposed changes to the electronic message digital displays or billboards. If adopted, these changes will not only significantly impact our business, but they will also impact numerous local businesses and, ch and many charitable organizations that we help promote and support with our digital technology in the city of Boise. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Christina, Christina Bruce Benyon. Okay, Christy Warhurst. Okay. Uh, uh, Wendy Matson, Steve Dunlap, or Barbara Gordon. Okay. There we go, Barbara. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Barbara Gordon, seven seven. Whoops, just a minute. Barbara Gordon, seven seven five zero West Tree Drive, eight three seven zero four. As we heard last night, we are going to see more demolition on parcel on parcels, perhaps. It's because the new code inadequately considered an important foundation in Blueprint Boise, and that is the vision of a community of stable neighborhoods and vibrant mixed-use activity centers. It states that this principle is equally as important as environmental stewardship and a strong, diverse economy. So stable neighborhoods are very important in Blueprint Boise. This comp plan speaks to the protection of established neighborhoods and lists infill design principles to be used along mixed use and corridors. The new code is vague and lacks specific language that would better protect and transition into established neighborhoods along mixed use and corridors. And it gives incentives to MX3 parcels in some neighborhoods that can give 50% parking reduction leaving over 40 cars from a single project looking for on-street parking. This parking reduction should be reduced and the, and the affordability incentive for AMI of 80% also reduced to meet the new code's goal of affordable housing. Also, I ask that the rezoning of LO to MX3 be on the basis of an LO parcel being within a quarter mile radius of a regional activity center rather than the one half mile radius it was changed to in the current draft of this code. It would still be twice the distance required for the community activity centers. This would give neighborhoods such as ours some protection against the Wall Street investors who think not, nothing of bulldozing homes and building and letting parcels set for three years. I live in a 1960s pocket neighborhood with over 65 parcels. We do enjoy a mix of housing types, including a Habitat for Humanity development. The R1B neighborhood surrounds parcels zoned LO, which front on Emeralds Road. The LO parcels are within one half mile from the Boise Town Square Mall, which triggers the LO parcels for rezone to MX3. So these will become 70 foot 
structures abutting an R1B parcel half that is half that height rather than the lower height of MX1 parcels. There is much good in the draft. I am asking for improvements in areas of transition and incentives. West Bench does not have a geographic city council representative until after the November election. And so I ask that a vote on this draft be postponed Tom. until after that election. And thank you for your service. Thank you. Okay. Um... Let's circle back real quick. Wendy Matson. Uh, okay. All right. Thanks. And then Steve Dunlap. Okay. And then after Mr. Dunlap, uh, Robert Overstreet, Tim Hennessy, and then Bonnie, Bonnie Hardy. I'm Steve Dunlap, 2342 East Independence Drive here in Boise. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to urge the city to delay voting on the zoning code rewrite. Since I became interested and involved in the ZCR, I've talked to neighbors and I've been surprised how few of them know about it. And it's even more concerning is that none of the neighbors I talked with really had any idea what sort of changes were coming our way because of it. My conversations were a tiny sample but they suggest that there needs to be a lot more outreach to assure that the people in Boise are informed enough to give informed consent for this change. I understand that a number of cities are ahead of us in the adoption of higher density zoning. Has it worked? Have Boise side cities realized a dramatic increase in affordable housing? I've searched for articles or data celebrating the success of increased affordable housing and I haven't found any so far. There will definitely be costs in the form of disrupted neighborhoods and lives associated with this change in order to pursue the benefit of more affordable housing. Let's delay the decision until the results in other cities show that the change was worth it. In addition to informed consent and confidence in success, we need to be fairly represented. In seven months, we will vote for the mayor and all city council positions. Let's wait to make the decision until the newly elected mayor and city council members are seated and the citizens of Boise are all represented by people they elected. There's no rush. I understand the current plan is to decide whether to adopt this plan in just a few weeks. This change will have dramatic effects for a very long time. Neighborhoods will be changed and people will be displaced from their current homes. Affordable housing results are not certain. This decision can wait until more people have enough information to give informed consent. This decision can wait until we are sure that the promised increase in affordable housing will occur and that it will justify the disruption caused to existing citizens and neighborhoods. And the decision really must wait until it can be made by duly elected representatives from each new city council district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Robert Overstreet, and then Tim Hennessy, Bonnie Hardy, and Juliana Plater. Thank you for the time tonight and thank you for your service. Uh, my name is Robert Overstreet. I reside at 604 South Granite Way in the East End. I was born and raised in Boise and I'm older than the current code. <clears throat> However, that does not mean we need to replace it. The upzone ordinance is not provoked. The upzone uh, ordinance is being sold to the public as an affordability driver. It is not an affordability driver. It's designed to get densities higher and the quality of life in existing neighborhoods to deteriorate. The upzone is designed to sell affordability, but it's a smokescreen for neighborhood destruction. How is this possible? What is affordable? In Boise, for a family of four, Affordability equates to a median income of $70,000 with a projected rent of $2,188.
that's defined as affordable. That is not affordable to 57% of Boiseans today. The average income in Boise is approximately $68,000. According to salary trackers at ZipRecruiter, 57% of all jobs fall below this uh, amount. Now, we all know that no developer is going to rent a unit for a penny under the maximum that he can legally do. Thus, the upzone ordinance leaves 57% of Boiseans without affordability options. That begs the question, why do we do the change? Is it because the city is more concerned with density and diversity than affordable housing? It certainly appears so. The term affordable housing is a term that has no meaning under the upzone ordinance. So how is this affordability incentive to be enforced and will rents really be affordable? According to the upzone ordinance, it will only look at rent. In a four apartment building, only one apartment has to be income protected. The code does not specify whether this must be a certain size, number of bedrooms or a studio, whether it can be accessible only by a poor door or what fees and deposits a landlord can charge. Basic economics will dictate that a below market rate, which is what this will be, will have a large renter interest in that apartment. So how is a landlord going to choose who gets the apartment? The upzone ordinance does not require the lowest income person and the, and the rent that he or she can pay. Rather, it just specifies a rent rate. So how will the landlord choose? I would think as a potential landlord myself, that I would charge an extremely large non-refundable move-in deposit. I would charge inspection fees, out of compliance fees, parking rent, pent rents, which will add significantly to the costs. Because you tie it to rent and not fees, it is not affordable. But the upzone so ordinance is silent on which of these will allow hmm. on what kind of fees the uh, the landlord will be able to short. It's not affordable. It's a smoke screen. It will not do what you are trying to sell to the public. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Okay, Tim Hennessy. And then uh, Bonnie Hardy, Juliana uh, Plater, and then Angela Banning. Hello, my name is Tim Hennessy. I live at um, North 17th Street in Boise. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. And I appreciate all your time and effort um, with this very heavy lift uh, assignment that you have in front of you. Um, I am support. I am in support of a rewrite of this code. I think it's outdated and is in uh, sore need of an update. So I am in favor of that. I am also in support of the city's uh, desire uh, to facilitate the creation of additional attainable housing in the city of Boise for sure. I think it's sorely needed. That's clear uh, from other uh, speakers tonight. But um, I think we can do better um, than expecting the citizens of Boise uh, to read a 611 page document uh, to become informed of what this uh, rewrite means. An executive summary, I couldn't find one, um, or a red line to the original uh, would have been very helpful, but it was not to be found. So I think for sure we can do better than that. Um, my biggest concern uh, with the proposal is the attempt um, to put this additional density into the long established neighborhoods of this city that do not have the infrastructure to support such density. One example comes to mind, public schools. No one has said the word tonight. Um, they are not sized appropriately for this influx of humans. Um, do we really want our kids taking classes in modular buildings sitting in the playground? Because that's what's going to happen, 100%. Lastly, the proposal to reduce the off-street parking requirement from two to one uh, is a surefire way to diminish the character of the beloved neighborhoods that this city has. I think we can do better. I think we can be smarter at focusing to trying to put the additional density into the areas of the city that have the infrastructure like downtown or focus that additional density into places where we can create the infrastructure appropriately. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Okay, uh, Bonnie Hardy. 
Okay, uh, Juliana Plater, then Angela Banning, Sherry Gorell, and Denise Zimmerman. Hello, um, I'm Juliana Plater. I live at 1617 North 5th Street in Boise. Been here since 2004, I love Boise. And I do not want the upzoning to happen in our beautiful Boise. I oppose the Boise, Zo Zo Boise zoning code as written. I'm here to ask you to rewrite the wireless ordinance code. Under um, I'm having a cell tower is really important to me to address this. Having a cell tower in your yard as close as 20 feet as permitted now devalues the home of value of the home up to 20% or higher. No cell tower should be any closer than 2,500 feet from any home. Other cities across the country have amended their codes to keep towers out of neighborhoods. We have witnessed our friends go into AFib and have had heart ablation surgery because of these towers. <clears throat> Ada County did the right thing and stopped two towers from being built next to homes last year. Other cities like Eagle, Dalton Gardens, Mountain Home, Ammon, Idaho, have said no to 5G wireless towers. They are building their own fast fiber optic networks. This is a safe, fast, and reliable system. Under the old code, we at least had the ability under the conditional use process to object to a tower going up in our front yards. This new rewrite took this away. If we want a green and sustainable city, then stop these towers from being in installed. When the city changed the wireless code, you were under the assumption that you were preempted from determining where small cell towers used for internet service could be located. This is not true. Further, even telecommunication towers can be stopped if there is no gap in coverage for making phone calls, as evidenced by the three towers that have been denied in Idaho in the last year because there was no substantial gap in coverage. You have been provided with a state-of-the-art zoning ordinance that has been implemented in Dalton Gardens, Idaho, and you have been provided with Eagle Idaho's ordinance and does not that does not allow any 5G small cells at all. We ask that you revise the wireless ordinance since you now have new this new information. Cell towers cause harm and should be at least again 2,500 feet from homes, not 20 feet. Cell towers decrease property values. For internet service, fiber optics to the premises is aesthetically pleasing, having significantly higher data speeds and is safe. These small cells are very dangerous and can be used to spy on its citizens and do cause significant harm. Further, these towers destroy bees, birds, and trees. They cause harm to humans and should not be in neighborhoods. The towers go against having a green and sustainable city. Thank you again for your service. Bye-bye. Thanks. Uh, Angela Benning. Okay. And then Sherry Gorell, Denise Zimmerman, and Jerry Michael Brady. You guys are a little older than what I'm used to addressing. So <laughs> you pretend you're all team. <clears throat> I'm all for affordable housing. I am not up for the density that the rezoning will bring. And for those that believe that rezoning will enable affordable housing, it's not a reality. I, lived, I moved to um, the Dallas-Fort Worth area in 1984, and that's, if anybody's been there, Dallas and Fort Worth, Irving, Arlington, Grand Prairie, everything was separate, and it was a drive to get places because there was nothing in between. I watched those two cities merge, and cities all grow the same way. People move in, and housing gets expensive. And so now, so now you've, I think it's about 50 miles out from Dallas, Frisco. It's now unaffordable. Everything is unaffordable, no matter how how many houses you put in Boise, it will not lower the cost of living unless you do government housing. Um, 
I was missing the dog. I am missing the dog's birthday party for this. And my nine-year-old granddaughter asked what I was going to do. And I told her, I said, you know, I'm very concerned that they are thinking about, you know, putting a lot more people in Boise and, you know, it's not that big. And she says, there's going to be a problem. People get frustrated. That's my words. They get angry. And she said, people will fight. And, you know, right now, we don't have a lot of the problems and issues that other towns do or other cities do. But I do know people that have been chased down on the freeway just to be honked out and flipped off because with density comes more anger issues. But in that same instance, we did into affordable housing, but poor, putting more houses on smaller lots of land is not the answer. So you do have a conundrum. I don't envy you that. And if you don't think you don't, we have a problem. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ms. Banning, can we get your address? Too? Yes. Thank you. 803 North 23rd Street. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, Sherry Gorell. And then Denise Zimmerman, Jerry, Michael Brady, and David Allen. Hello. My name is Sherry Gorell, and I live at 716 West Franklin Street, number one, Boise. Boise is growing. How large do we allow it to become? Why did housing prices explode, not only in Boise, but most cities around the country during the pandemic? I am suspicious that there are growing populations within every other city. And there are also these Boise or these modern zoning codes being written in other cities. My suggestions are, number one, the city of Boise needs to be transparent with our community members and not allow big pharma, big tech, big egg, big rock, and the federal government, big money influencers to change the landscape of Boise based on their agenda. You will own nothing and you will be happy. You will basically rent and you will ride your bike. I don't agree that what we're proposing here is going to cause rents to decrease. Number two, we need to honor the integrity of individual neighborhoods. We cannot allow single family homes to be quietly torn down and replaced with overly tall, expensive fourplexes. There are so many other options, such as allowing people to add apartments above their garages or in their sunny basements or tiny houses in their backyards. Then the people can benefit financially from creating the extra housing, not some out of state developer. Number three, we need to fill and be safe in our city. We need to update the telecommunications or wireless ordinance code and continue to build fast fiber optic, optic networks underground. We do not want to have dangerous radiation pulsating 5G small and large cell towers 20 feet from our homes. These cause harm to people, defoliate trees and kill bees. We do not want our city of trees to become the city of 5G towers and high density apartments. We need to protect the air we breathe and the water we drink. We continue to hear the term climate change when our skies are being plummeted day by day with crisscross chemtrails, also referred to as geoengineering or weather modification. I notice very few people want to look at me when I say that. It's happening almost daily, and nobody's questioning it. These toxic chemicals should not be allowed in our skies over our beautiful city. By the way, I was born and raised in Boise. I have lived here all my life. The best team is a diverse team with different viewpoints. Our current mayor and city council do not hold diverse viewpoints, nor do they truly represent the citizens of Boise Time. as new members were handpicked by the mayor. 
Um, we need to wait to vote and finalize the official zoning code rewrite until after the mayor and city council elections. Um, I do oppose the Boise Modern Zoning Code as written, and I do think we need okay. an executive summary and involvement of more community members. I just found out about this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Denise Zimmerman, right? and then Michael, Jerry, Michael Brady, David Allen, and Peter Torma. Denise Zimmerman, 4375 Plum Street. The second goal of the Zoning Code Read-Write talks about providing a coordinated and efficient development that encourages affordable and fair housing. Affordable housing is defined as a residential dwelling for which the household pays no more than 30% of their gross income for housing costs, including utilities, and where the annual household income does not exceed 80% of the area median income, or AMI. According to Boise Housing Needs Analysis in 2020, it is believed that Boise needs around 2,773 additional homes every year. 77% of those homes, or 2,145 new homes, is needed per year for households earning 80% or less of AMI. As I talk about the affordable units, that could be provided by this read write. Remember, affordable units are only provided by developers and, and builders wishing to receive an incentive. They are not required. And rental costs will go up whenever the area median income goes up, whether your income goes up or not. In residential R1 zones of medium to large size lots, the rewrite provides incentives to developers who provide up to two affordable units in buildings of three to 12 dwellings. In residential compact and urban zones and mixed use zones, the rewrite has incentives for developers that make 25% of their units affordable to households, making up to 60% of AMI. There are no incentives for affordability in the downtown zone, nor within most of the many Boise acres that aren't located close to major roadway or mixed use zones. Single family homes on their own lot will not receive incentives. Let's say that Boise gets the 2,773 additional homes and that at best 25% or 693 are actually affordable. The Boise needs analysis says we need 2,145 affordable homes. This far exceeds the 693 potential affordable homes this rewrite could provide. This rewrite does not come close to encouraging the needed affordable housing. Also, all of the incentives for affordable units are only provided in residential zones that are close to a major roadway, close to a mixed use zone, or are actually located in a mixed use zone. This is not fair housing. What it does is segregate low income households into less desirable areas. Crowded areas with excess noisy, noise, less clean air, less space, less green area, less sunshine, and no privacy amongst commercial office and institutional businesses. This rewrite does not meet this very important goal. Do not, Time. I do not support this rewrite. Thank you. Okay, Jerry, Michael Brady, and then David Allen, Peter Torma, and then Jeffrey Wardle. My name is Jerry Brady. I live at 2042 East Trolley uh, Court in East Boise. And I'm here to speak in support of the zoning code on behalf of LEAP Housing. LEAP is a nonprofit that works on affordable housing. It's young, it's innovative. Its goal is to build 1,000 affordable houses, to build, protect, or, or to refurnish 1,000 houses by 2026. We think we're, we're about halfway there. Uh, right now, we're building 25 homes for people earning 60% of the medium income or less. Uh, how difficult it is, I can't tell you. It's impossible. In this environment, there's these interests, but we're getting it done. But how difficult this is and how long this has taken and what's the prospect? Our goal is 1,000. The city has another goal, 1,000 or more. But these are just a drop in the bucket, really, against the total problem. 
So I, I want to sort of drop my thoughts of what I would have said, except to draw this point. A rising tide lifts all boats, right? You can see that as an analogy with water. It's kind of true with houses. You've only, you've got to keep building a whole lot of houses before poor people finally occupy what's left. We have a bad situation right now. We know that this housing code has produced a bad situation. We're not building affordable homes. We're not building enough homes. We've been over-discovered. Too bad. We got here. It all, we're thinking about this thing about 10 or 22 years late. But here we are. It seems to us that the, 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 the choice is to pass this and keep working at it. Because otherwise, we're not going to get anywhere. I don't, I don't agree with postponing six months. It'll be another six months after that. So I want to just focus, <laughs> finish at one more point. Uh, I live uh, just below the Botanical Gardens in the East End. And in the last month or so, there's just been a rush of people remodeling, uh, cleaning up. It's just, <laughs> it's full of contractors. And so I asked them, all the people working there, where do you live? Melba, Homedale, Nampa, Meridian, CUNA. One lived on Federal Way, and she said, my husband and I can't afford, they're kicking us out because the rent's too high. We've got to also allow people to live where they work, where they go to school, uh, where they shop. We're not doing that. It's a crazy, crazy, crazy system. I, I, I don't envy you just trying to sell this thing out, but the old system that we're working on now is not working. And for affordables, our only idea is, for, from a point of view, lift all boats, build as many houses as you can. The plan of building hmm. along uh, major highways is, uh, is a good one, and, uh, and I leave it to that. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, David Allen. Okay, uh, Peter Torma. He's online. Yep. Okay. And then Jeffrey Wardle, Ben Ovard, and Ryan McGoldrick. Mr. Chair, I need Sorry. to be, uh, well, there's going to be just one moment before I can uh, elevate him to speak. Gotcha. You want us to jump to Mr. Wardle? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get through Mr. We'll get through Mr. Wardle and Mr. Torma online. Sorry, who's online? Yep. And then we'll take a little break. Commissioners, my name is Jeffrey Wardle. My address is 251 East Front here in Boise, Suite 310. In uh, 1973, I started coming to planning and zoning and city council meetings here in the city of Boise with my father, who was the then planning director. And little did I know that I would probably spend at least one day a month here with you over the last 50 years. Ideally, I wouldn't need to be here and we would be able to reduce the need for you to be here. And that is a goal that this zoning ordinance accomplishes. It does not deprive the public of a say. It does not deprive the public of due process. It incentivizes the conduct that we as a community have said we want to pursue. Now, our firm provided you with comments. We are a land use and development firm. People hire us. Unfortunately, in recent years, I'm finding more and more people needing my help to do the right thing, to build ADUs to build affordable units that are deed restricted. It takes a lot of time, effort, energy, and money. Now, this is not a new process. In fact, the process we are in the home stretch of now began more than 13 years ago when we adopted Blueprint Boise, which was a fundamental, a fundamental change in our comprehensive plan in this community. We went from the reactive check the box to a comprehensive plan that set forth a vision. It set forth a vision of density. It set forth a vision of housing. It set forth a vision of mixed use development. Now, 
I listened to staff's presentation last night and I appreciated their observations on PUDs and conditional use permits for things that are largely dimensional. And as you know, I've been in front of you on a lot of applications where we are here solely talking about the heights of parapets to be able to make them structurally fit. That is not a good use of your time. It's not a good use of the citizen's time. It's not a good use of staff time. This code, I believe, fully implements the path that we set for this community when we said we want Blueprint Boise. And you know, I'm in front of you regularly and we talk a lot about the comprehensive plan. I think too that you would know over the years that I have come to embrace Blueprint Boise because I recognize the value of it. The decisions that you're hearing criticized though as being rushed were decisions that we made as a community. And this zoning code rewrite didn't just start Let's not ignore the fact that it was the prior administration under Mayor Beter four plus years ago that started the rewrite of this code. We will have fewer PUD applications. We will have fewer CUP applications. And it's not because we're depriving the public of a say, it's because we're building what you told us to under Blueprint Boise. And I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, staff, are we good with Mr. Torma online? Yeah, hello, my name is Peter Torma. I live at 2213 South Ormond, Boise. Um, I just have some comments on the plan. Specifically, I think the most important part of the plan is the purpose section. And you guys list out seven, seven things there that I feel need to be measurable, some way that you can determine success. There needs to be some sort of threshold and then some sort of response. So for instance, there's, you know, we're supposed to promote public health, safety, and general welfare to the present future residents. How do you measure that? And what happens if we're not attaining that through this plan? If we wait and then tweak the plan later in the future, then it just becomes an opinion. You need to set these goals today before the plan is signed and move forward. So then there's a toolbox that you guys can adjust uh, the plan to. So maybe you have multiple ways in which you address a public health and safety issue instead of just waiting to tweak the plan in the future. I think this is extremely important because a plan isn't as good if you can't implement it. And if you can't implement it with changes, then you're just gonna be doing the same thing again 60 years from now and thinking we missed it. Another thing that is confusing to me in the purpose section is just some of the words in there I don't understand why you would need to say we're promoting a diverse, inclusive communities. I don't even know why that's needed in this document. I mean, don't we already have that in Boise? Um, equitable transportation system for pedestrian bikes, bicyclists and transits and vehicles. I don't think it's equitable when, our, when we have built our city on roads and for cars, not for the other things. Um, there also needs to be an emphasis in this plan of having businesses be responsible to help Boise grow. I don't see anything in this plan that says, hey, how is a Micron or another business gonna help solve the problem through solar panels, through providing housing for the employees that are needed? They, we're pushing all the responsibility onto the, the existing subdivisions. And, and I feel like the business owners have a responsibility to help Boise grow. And there's nothing in here that says they're going to do that. And until they are, then it's just gonna continually be a problem over and over and over. I also don't feel like there's been enough analysis of the cumulative impacts of all of this plan. There's talks about each individual one, but how does it all tie together? And yes, it's not an environmental impact statement document or anything, but I think there could be some of that at least brought forward and tied together. Um, and I think lastly, the last thing I'd like to say is I think this plan should be voted on by the newly elected commission versus waiting to do it in a hurry. There is no hurry. It has taken four years, another couple of weeks, another couple of months. It's not going to change the result and the problems of affordable housing and these sort of things that the issues that you're trying to solve. It's, I'd say you get the plan done right the first time versus trying to go back and fix it because that's kind of what we're doing right now. We're trying to fix a bad plan. So that's what I got. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And I understand you have a difficult job here and uh, thanks for all your hard work. Okay, thanks. All right, with that, we'll take a quick 
five minute break. All right, we're planning to wrap up recess during at 10 o'clock tonight. That's a little over an hour from now. We're still gonna have probably a few names left on our list. So we're gonna probably move this into tomorrow at 10 o'clock recess until tomorrow. Just wanna prep everybody. We're probably not gonna get through all the names tonight. So with that, we'll just keep on going with our process here. Uh, up next, Ben Ovard, and then Ryan McGoldrick, Nina Pinar, and Dane Hoskins. Any takers? Uh, I'm here. Mr. Oh, online, online. Thank you, staff. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Mr. Ovard, can you hear us? Yes, can you hear me? Can you, uh, yeah, we, we can hear you, but you're really quiet. Let me hit your volume. Uh, yeah. Is this better? I'll just get yeah, closer. Better. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Ben Ovard. I'm at 619 Whitehall Street, um, and I'm speaking in support of the zoning code rewrite. Um, I graduated college three years ago. Um, with a degree in computer science. Um, and despite a, a well-paying job as a software engineer, um, I can no longer afford to live in the city that I grew up in, that I was born and raised in. Um, as well as many of my friends and family have been priced out um, and have had to, to move further and further out of the city to Nampa, to Mountain Home, to Twin Falls. Um, as well as, um, you know, a lot of my friends are living in apartments with roommates because they, despite you know us being in our mid to late 20s, still can't afford their own apartment. Some have had to move back in with their parents. Um, my sister and brother-in-law and their family um, had to move out to the outskirts of Nampa um, because they could no longer afford to live in Boise. Um, so they now commute, commute an hour from, from Nampa into downtown Boise for work. Um, and, you know, is we, you know, we did everything right. We went to college, we got good grades, uh, we got good jobs, and yet we still can't afford to live in the city that we grew up in um, because there is a lack, a shortage of housing. Um, I support the, the zoning code rewrite because we need more housing so that locals don't continue to get priced out. Um, Boise was recently ranked one of the most unaffordable housing markets in America uh, for wages compared to housing costs. Um, so we need more housing um, of all types and, and the zoning code rewrite will create that. Um, I've heard a lot of people talking about the city's character, the neighborhood's character. I would say that the city's character does not come from the physical buildings, but rather from the people that live there. Um, and, and we're losing a lot of those people. People are so focused on the houses we might lose, they might get torn down. They don't see the, uh, the people that we're losing every single day um, from our lack of housing in the city. Um, so thank you for your time. Uh, and that's all I have to say. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, Ryan McGoldrick, McGoldrick, thank you. Okay. And then Nina uh, Pinar, and then Dane Hoskins, and then Matthew Ariaga. Uh, my name is Ryan McGoldrick, and my address is 2212 North 19th Street, and I'm here on behalf of Conservation Voters for Idaho in support of the proposed modern zoning code. Um, first, I'd like to start off by thanking the, the City of Boise staff for the extensive public outreach they conducted to develop the proposed zoning code over the last three years. Um, Director Keene shared this yesterday, but I think it's worth repeating. Um, there were 29 community conversations across the city, 23 citizen advisory committee meetings, five surveys with uh, 7,000 responses, 35 stakeholder meetings, seven presentations to city council, 12 commission or committee meetings, multiple rounds of mailers that went out to residents and staff attended many local events to educate folks that were just showing up to events. Um, I know they also, at most of those things that I attended, they were asking folks, like if you have someone that we're, you don't think we're reaching, like please suggest ways we can reach out to them. They asked multiple times, they were looking for suggestions, they were setting up new meetings. Um, so for a lot of the folks that are suggesting that it wasn't an extensive enough process, I would ask like, what, what are their suggestions for better ways to do the outreach? Um, and that's something that I don't think I, I really heard a lot of is like, what is the, what input would you like to see before we got to a point where you're, you're satisfied with the public outreach? I mean, I know there's always more we can do and we would love to be able to reach every single resident 
Um, but as someone who we do public outreach, that's what a lot of what CVI does. And it is incredibly difficult to reach folks. Um, one of the things that we actually did before uh, developing our, our suggestions and our proposals for this was going out and starting doing door knocking. Um, so we went over the last few weeks and knocked on about 500 doors of folks. That's extremely time intensive, takes a lot of work. And we reached about, talked to maybe like 100 to 150 folks. Um, again, that's like weeks of work for us to do that. That's not something that the city of Boise staff can be expected to like go out and do. Um, so some of the things we heard over the past few weeks was whether folks were supportive or not. Um, one thing we heard a lot was that Boise residents want homes that are affordable at price points that they and their families can afford. Uh, they want walkable communities with trees and access to parks and open spaces. And Boise residents want to ensure that we're using our resources efficiently, uh, whether that resource is land, uh, water, or energy. Um, and so with that, we found that this was uh, followed the best, the best practices and the best things to, to reach those goals. And that's why uh, we submitted a letter in support uh, from Conservation Voters for Idaho, um, from Ketch, Idaho Conservation League, Neighbors for Boise, Idaho Chapter Sierra Club, the Boise Bike Project Board of Directors, Idaho Walk Bike Alliance, Golden Eagle Audubon Society, and the Canals Connect Community Coalition. These are all groups working in conservation, working in housing, working in transportation, and we're doing this work and we're, we're seeing that this is the, these are the best practices and this is what we need to do to achieve the, the goals that we want to have. Um, and the last thing I'll end with is that I think Plus the three years, I think it's important to remember that the public outreach didn't start with just the zoning code rewrite. It started with Blueprint Boise. So this is following up on that. So this is not just three years of extensive outreach. This also includes years before that of additional outreach for Blueprint Boise. So with that, I will thank, excuse me, thank you for all you do and thank you to the staff again. Thank you. So, Appreciate it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Nina Pinar is online and then Dean Hoskins, Matthew Ariaga. Chandler, Hadraba, and Katie Fight. Good evening. Can you hear me? We can. Hello. Great. Um, I would like to, sorry, my name is Nina Pinna. I live at 1516 North 21st Street, Boise, Idaho. I would like to express my strong support for the new modern code. The proposed changes represent a significant step forward um, in promoting sustainable and equitable development practices, as well as creating a more livable and vibrant city for all residents. One of the key benefits of this new code is its emphasis on mixed use development. By allowing a wider range of uses in each area, we can create more walkable and bikeable communities that offer a greater variety of services and amenities. This in turn will encourage more transit friendly neighborhoods while also, fo also fostering economic development and gro job growth. I work for the Boise Bicycle Project, and we see firsthand how important a bicycle can be to so many families in the Valley. But for that bicycle to have the effect we hope for it to have, every family needs to have access to safe places to ride, and a network that makes daily trips by bike possible. And the new, the new code can make that a reality with higher densities and mixed use development. I'm also pleased to see that the new code includes stronger protections for affordable housing. As our city grows, we must make sure that everyone can find a safe place and affordable place to live. And also ensuring that Boise remains a diverse and inclusive city. I appreciate the city's efforts to make the planning process more accessible and transparent, which means more residents are able to engage in the planning process and have a greater say in how their neighborhoods are developed. Overall, I believe that the new zoning code has the potential to significantly improve the quality of life for all Boise residents by pro promoting sustainable, equitable, and livable development practices. I urge you to support the zoning code and work towards making our city a better place to live. And lastly, I'd just like to say thank you so much for all the hard work you and your planning team have put into the zoning code. I know it's a huge lift. Thank you so much. Um, okay. I actually have Dane Hoskins sitting next to me is would it be easier to just have them yeah, stay on the same line? That'd be great. Yes, thank you. Awesome. Here he is. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dane Hoskins, also of 1516 North 21st Street, Boise. And I would also like to speak briefly in support of the zoning code rewrite. Um, as many have testified, Already, I have also seen and experienced the dire need 
uh, for additional housing. Um, this zoning code rewrite is not a panacea by any means or a complete solution, but it is a, definitely a valuable step in the right direction, one component of a larger housing ecosystem to build the units that we need. Um, I really only wish to note that the increased diversity of units will allow me and my family to remain kind of a resident of Boise um, over the long term. Uh, the only other note I'd really like to add to this evening is we've started to get results from other zoning code rewrites in other cities. I was just reading about Minneapolis this week that have lowered costs for renters while raising property values for surrounding neighbors. Uh, land use changes like this can be a win-win for the community. Um, that is all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, Matthew Ariaga and then Chandler Hadraba and Katie Fight. <clears throat> Good evening, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Matt Ariaga. I live at 1617 Sunrise Rim, just off Vista, eh, probably about a couple hundred feet away from the new 48 acre, seven story new development. Uh, I'm a mediator, I work settling commercial lawsuits. I've settled thousands of them, including mostly insurance, but commercial. This is, <laughs> I never wanted to be an attorney, but this has lawsuits written all over it. Um, so a couple of things pointed out to me whenever there's decisions being made is go back to the basics. So City of Boise on the website, create a city for everyone embracing our community and decision-making process. Okay. We're in that process right now, but there's <laughs> the transparency there's some question marks on that. I think you've, you've heard that. Um, innovate and invest in protect our environment. I got question marks on that one too. And I'll get into that in a sec. Um, for the greatest good, I'll get into that second. Another one also. As a public official or some of you are appointed, uh, the re relationship, trust, values, actions, honesty are most important. Once that trust is lost, it's almost never comes back. Does that matter? With such significant permanent decisions, being made, shouldn't everyone be present? I know we have a couple that are appointed, a couple others that aren't represented, and then 611 pages that is very hard to decipher. Maybe you guys understand it, but I question the secrecy, the rush. I know it's been in the process, but it's been 60 years. Another six months, a year is not going to change anything. Let's make it right. As a full-time mediator, when I settle lawsuits, all parties and decision makers need to be present to even move forward. Uh, yet we enact uh, zoning changes when all parties aren't even present, which is the situation we're in right now. Does that make sense? If it's really about affordable housing, which everyone's already kind of beat that up a little bit, um, it'd be required or agreed to. Uh, why is the actual affordable housing not required? Why can't there be some middle ground instead of <laughs> being able to tear down these single family homes like mine and building, you know, quad plex or bigger buildings, four, four units, four story high right next to us. We ever wonder why Idaho has issues with Californians and Salt Lake City developers? Well, we're seeing it right now. This is some of the biggest taxpayers in Boise are those developers. Was it green? Well, there was two trees on the new development, so I guess it's green. Um, does it help nature? Well, we covered the land with concrete. Now it's protected and that's good. All right. Water. Okay. We, we have water runoff for concrete and now that's going into the, um, into our irrigation, obviously, and drains. And then we get taxed more for the infrastructure. What's your legacy? Well, I helped build developers, build the most densely populated area in Idaho, covering up nature, open lots, tearing down single family homes, blocking others' views, sunlight, kind of like a national cattle processor where cattle live in a very small area, but we did the same. We used to do with people. Is that what Idaho is about? Is this what you want mm -hmm. to be? If only we can make a decision. Oh, wait, we're here. Or we can punt, push it off a little bit uh, for the next six months or so. Thank you for your time. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Uh, Chandler Hadraba? Yep. yep. Okay. And then Katie fights next. Uh, my name is Chandler Hadraba. I live in the Collister neighborhood. Um, and I am the Republican vice chair for Legislative District 16, and I also have successfully litigated environmental law against every major municipality in the state of California and the state of, and the state itself. Um, the city of Santa Monica has a uh, rights of nature doctrine, which I think is really important and seems to be in line with what you're doing and whereby entities that normally don't have standing do. 
And I returned back to the excellent testimony given here before by another gentleman. And I asked the question, what about the trees? How many trees are gonna be murdered by this high density plan that you're putting forth? Every sketch, everything I've seen, it's concrete, it's big buildings, it's the death of trees, it's the death of green space. While people will uh, slam you know, green grass and, and elderly trees, the benefit to being a sponge when we have rain and runoff is, is immeasurable. And uh, you know, with the rains, historic rains that we had this year, uh, the stress to our existing infrastructure is just gonna be get even worse and you're gonna further exacerbate it. And my really worry is if you look at somewhere like Chicago, the metro area there has had such a problem with growth and development and runoff that uh, what happens is the sewers back up and poop flows down the street. So I hope we don't have that problem here. But what they had to do to solve it was to build, it was called deep tunnel. And it was a 10 foot diameter, 30 foot long tunnel that could hold up to a billion gallons of water to be waylaid before being treated. So once again, how are we not gonna have that same problem here? And other than the homeowners, who's gonna get stuck paying for this bill? Uh, you should take more time on it. And I really like, once again, the two trees that someone talked about, look, I got two 50 year old oaks in my backyard and the, the shade and the benefits to birds and wildlife in my neighborhood. Um, and there's a big space behind there. And I'm looking at my neighborhood, big, these buildings are going up. That's the land that's right behind my house is perfect for this. But the problem is when they put it in, those two big trees that I have that go out of my yard into my neighbor's yards that they like, that they appreciate, that the birds love, that the squirrels love, that new landowner could say, cut your trees down and it'll be gone. So please uh, don't give us more time. I live in district two. My representative was appointed. I want it to be Grant Burgoyne, but he's not there. And I'd like the chance to vote for him this fall. So please let my voice be heard and give us the chance and delay it tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you fight? Yep. Hello, uh, Katie Fight, 1006 North 5th, Boise. Why I urge the Planning and Zoning Commission to reject the upzone. Tyranny, it's top down tyranny for Boise leaders to impose a code rewrite, cutting the public's voice out of the development decisions that will profoundly alter our Boise neighborhoods. Transparency will be lost. Developers will push projects on city staff with no public hearings, increasing potential for corruption. Projects will be set in stone, and the public's only recourse will be expensive appeals. Crucial development decisions that could drive us out of our homes or apartments will be made behind closed doors at City Hall. Teardowns will multiply. Existing affordable housing will be hauled away as trash to the landfill and replaced by new larger structures with a carbon pollution footprint. How not to get to net zero. Tree canopy cover will be chopped down. The city of trees will become the city of stumps, harsh concrete, and an unhealthy environment. Temperatures will shoot up. The urban heat island effect will rise as green space vanishes. Trauma. The social fabric of our community will, will be ripped apart as predatory speculators swoop in. Turning Boise into a city of transitory renters where regular folks can't afford a home and workers live in fear of rent skyrocketing, skyrocketing and impending homelessness. Terrorize. How renters will feel when landlords keep raising rents and they endless, endlessly have to move to survive. How seniors will feel when they can no longer stay in their home as tax assessments climb and gentrification engulfs them. Taking away a good place to live from all those who helped build this community over the 60 years that the existing code and various modifications have served us well. Taking from those who invested their life savings to buy a house in a pleasant place. Taking from neighborhood groups who spent thousands of collective hours crafting plans for livable neighborhoods. Taxes will go through the roof. Seniors and workers, workers will be forced to flee somewhere more affordable. Traffic jammed. Streets are already clogged as our weak public transportation system falls further and further behind. Transfer of wealth will take place. High density apartments and Airbnbs will be owned by Wall Street speculators and transnational corporations. Money will flow out of Boise. Civic values will suffer. Trickle down housing has failed to produce affordability wherever it's been tried. This complex, confusing 600 plus page code change and comprehensive plan revision will foster a wild west, growth, wild west growth mentality and chaotic development. Robert Barron style developers will chart a city's future, converting Boise to a city of renters at the mercy of landlords. Any large scale zoning code change could, should come up from the people and be conducted through close study of and consultation with individual neighborhoods. It should not be imposed 
top down using expensive consultants who spoon fed boilerplate growth industry schemes resisted in other cities to a committee weighted with development interests handpicked by the mayor. Any change of this magnitude must be put on the ballot for a public vote. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right, we are through all of the folks have previously signed up. And now we are down to the list of folks that signed up this evening. And a few of you have already spoken. We'll start at the top of that list. Uh, Douglas Drink Drinko? Drinka? Drinka. Thank you. Okay. And then uh, sorry, Larry. Oh, it's Lamar. Okay, we got those guys. And then George Hanlon. And then Ian McLaughlin. Chairman Schaefer, members of the commission, my name is Doug Drinka. I'm at 3808 North Hawthorne Drive, and I'm president of the Coster Neighborhood Association, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the neighborhood today. Um, I want to stay, start by thanking the planning and development staff. Um, you guys have provided a multitude of education and feedback opportunities over the past two years. Um, you've shown your commitment to charting the path for the shape of the city for the next 20 years. And I'm especially thankful for the way you listen to our feedback, engaged with it, and actually made changes in, in response to that feedback. Um, I've felt very heard and valued through this process. Yesterday, we heard a plan of action coming together. Staff will create a set of metrics to measure the success of the modern code. We'll put the code into place, even if it's not quite perfect. We'll come back a year later, review the metrics, make some changes, continue this iterative process into the future. This won't work. Here's why. Municipalities must tread carefully to avoid triggering a government taking when changing zoning laws. Once an entitlement is offered, it can't be canceled later. For example, in the current modern code drafts, uh, staff may have liked to require additional affordability or sustainability requirements. They can't just create those requirements. Instead, they had to come in the form of new incentives. <clears throat> if a parcel is upzoned, it can't be downzoned by the city. If an incentive is offered, it can't just be removed or modified. We have to get this right the first time. In the proposed draft, uh, city staff have tried to strike a balance between the pace of development and the right kinds of development using incentives. Last year, city staff had a low level of confidence that the incentives would even be widely used. This year, the housing market looks completely different from last year. The chances the balance struck now, today, that that will be viable for the next 20 years is minuscule. There's no way to adjust that balance towards more affordability or more sustainability in the future. We've sold the farm. We can never say, if you want 12 units per acre in R1C, you'll need half of those to be affordable. Instead, forever, 12 units will be allowed. There's no carrot left. There's no stick left. We need a solution that adapts without creating entitlements. So one option is to move slowly to adjust density and make sure it's care carefully attached with um, uh, changes to the affordability structure that might come down the pike in the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years uh, instead of making changes all at once. Um, I would love for consideration of something like an incentive program instead of by right grants of additional density, where each year the commission could review the housing metrics, make predictions for the coming year, create a pool of incentives available to, to developers. And when the pool is exhausted, no incentives of that type are available until the next year. Um, I know that this idea is really complicated, um, but we've got really smart people in Boise, partner with the BSU Center for Public Policy. We could do something complicated like this um, that makes it adaptable and um, adjustable, not just for, uh, for year two, three, or 20. Thanks. Thank you. We can, we can talk about that. Hi, my name is George Hall, and I live at uh, 4705 West Denton up on the bench in Morse Hill. Uh, and I'd just like to start off by saying I totally support um, the update. Um, as the I think Commissioner Gillespie said at the beginning, and a bunch of people have alluded to, there's this disruption and change. And I think that's kind of the nature of the entire conversation. All we know is change, and all we know is it's going to keep changing. And a lot of the issues that affordability, infrastructure, schools, all of this stuff we've been dealing with has been a direct, not directly correlated to the old code, but it's heavily influenced the path we've been on. 
Um, and maybe I've missed it, but it just seems like there's no one that said, I support the old, old, co old code because it's working so well. Um, so I think it's time we actually try something new and try to get innovative. Um, it's kind of the only shot we got to say, all right, let's try something new. Um, just want to touch on a couple affordability pieces. I, I would like to see that suite expanded in any way we can. I think the country, the economy looks at affordability in kind of a myopic way. It's your income, and then you got to be able to afford 30% of that. Um, I think there's, as a renter who is currently looking for a place to live, I leave my house in the month. I have about six applications out right now. Um, I think a huge piece to renting is stability. I would like to see a, if there's any, I don't know if it's legal or not, but uh, to add three-year lease options and you get more density if you're providing more stability within your developments. That way you have renters who aren't co constantly washing out year after year. And then the thing not many people talk about is when you get to the end of your lease, a lot of times you get trapped between paying double rent. So I pay $1,500 for a house I'm moving out of right away and then two grand for the next one. So it becomes incrementally more expensive over time. Um, the house I'm currently living in is the first house I've lived in for two years since I lived at home, my parents. That is the trend for all young people renting. It's very rare you see someone that gets five years to just hang out and stay in their spot. Um, another option would be a rent to own structure as, an, as some sort of a density bonus. We need more home ownership. That's a huge issue, it seems. Um, and then the last thing I would touch on is um, I think it's a, like the fireman said, when you just watch a fire coming up with the perfect plan, the fire gets huge. Um, personally, I think delaying this issue um, for that will that will it will be inherently become more political if we allow the entire city to start running on this as their number one political issue, and then all of a sudden we are stuck with an old code and things keep getting more unaffordable. Um, I lived in Austin, Texas. Their code fell apart and they haven't been able to fix any of their problems because they weren't even allowed to try the new problem, try new solutions. So um, thank you guys for everything you've done and I hope we get it done. Thank you. Okay, Ian McLaughlin and then uh, Grant Walden, Eric Morrison and Bill Basham. Good evening, uh, I'm Ian McLaughlin. I live at 5206 North Sunderland in the West Bench. I wanna start by thanking the planning and zoning staff. Um, as a member of the uh, Citizens Advisory Committee, I know all the hard work, uh, late night or well, late nights, uh, careful examination and outreach that they did. And I wanna thank them for that. I wanna also thank you commissioners for being here tonight and listening to me talk. Um, I'm not a native, uh, Boisean. Uh, I moved here in 2019 with my wife. Uh, we fell in love with the city, as you all are very familiar with, mostly because it's an amazing place to live. You got connection to outdoors, and people here are really, truly nice. Um, we, like I said, we fell in love with the city. Uh, we uh, lived a little bit in the southeast for a little bit, loved having bikeability, loved having access to different amenities. Ultimately, we started looking for a house. We got extremely lucky and we would not have been able to afford a house if it was not for a little thing called the pandemic uh, and a brief uh, pause in the rise of housing costs. So um, we have come to love our neighborhood. We love our neighbors. They're great. Um, we have access to parks. Um, one thing the West Bench kind of lacks is, I would say, walkability. Um, and I think one thing that the new zoning or proposed zoning code uh, would address is uh, walkability to amenities, um, cafes, restaurants, things like that, which I would love to see in our neighborhood. Um, one cool thing about our neighborhood is we have a mix of housing. We have duplexes right next to single family homes and it works great. Um, I think, uh, you know, we keep hearing, oh, well, why don't we just delay it another six months? Why don't we just delay it another six months? And I think that's a slippery slope. Um, ultimately, I think um, we're going to run into the same issues that are happening regionally, um, issues that we're seeing in Ketchum, Idaho, Sun Valley, McCall, where people that, you know, help uh, our city run smoothly, service workers, police officers, teachers, people in healthcare, those people won't be able to afford a house here. 
and that's a problem. So I support and view the new zoning code as an order and it's essential to coping with the changes that we're facing as a city. Um, and I think as a city, we should choose to prepare for the future that we want and a city that we can be proud of. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks. Okay, uh, Grant Walden. Okay, uh, Eric Morrison. Okay, and then after Mr. Morrison, Bill Basham, Robert Overstreet, and then Kristen Overstreet. Uh, ladies and gentlemen of the Planning and Zoning Commission, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Eric Morrison. I live at 1307 South Denver Avenue in an old garage converted into a one bedroom apartment in an alley. I'm a proud Boisean and a resident and um, founder of Alley Homes, a company focused on providing affordable ADUs or accessory dwelling units. Um, I'm in favor of the zoning code rewrite, particularly in easing the size limits and removing the deed restriction. So I did submit this entire testimony verbatim already via email. So I'm gonna go a little bit off script and uh, add a couple of notes that I didn't mention before. So I am a highly sensitive person um, and we are many. Uh, there's not people that like to cry a lot. What it means is that we sense more information from the environment, um, sounds and smells and that sort of thing. And we're 20% of the population. And uh, my first three years that I lived here in Boise uh, were in just big, large, blocky apartment buildings. And I will tell you that those are absolutely miserable for sensitive people. Um, and that's mostly because developers don't insulate properly between the walls, but that's a whole tangent I won't go on. So um, it means a lot that I found my little alley ADU. Uh, it's been a godsend. It's been um, amazing. And uh, it's improved my quality of life dramatically. And so I'm very passionate about this issue and making sure that ADUs stay affordable, accessible, and that um, I had a consultation with an ADU developer in Portland, and he made a very important point, which is that cities that he's worked with that limit um, the size of the total ADU that can be built on a property and that also implement these deed restrictions that greatly in, uh, hinders a city's ability to proliferate um, ADUs, which is good for homeowners and for in-laws and for people like me. So um, there is one other point. This is completely going in a different direction, but I, I wanted to bring this up. Um, there's been some conspiracy theories going around tonight. One thing is not a conspiracy. That's artificial intelligence. It is here. And um, robo taxis, that is self-driving cars. Tesla has almost solved it. Um, Waymo has solved it in Arizona. And so uh, people are not going to own as many vehicles in the near future, probably five to 10 years from now. And so I bring this up because uh, parking has come up a lot. And I think that it's something important to consider um, I believe that boy students can think into the future that we can be innovative and look forward and look ahead. And um, the fact that many, many people are not going to own personal vehicles in the future should have some bearing on, um, you know, these sort of parking requirements. So just something I wanted to bring up. And um, yeah, that's about it. I, I thank you for your time and consideration. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Bill Basham. Robert Overstreet, Kristen, Kristen Overstreet, Paula Schopacher. Yeah, I saw that. Kristen. I'd like to testify against the uh, current plan of uh, zoning, changing the zoning in Boise. Uh, my name is Paula Schopacher, and I live at 922 East Curling Drive in Boise. Um, I'm a 79-year, fourth-generation North Ender. And I thought that um, I would be carried out feet first from the North End, and that's what I wanted. But about four and a half years ago, when the city council passed the uh, uh, accessory dwelling units, and I saw what was happening in our neighborhood with the traffic up and down the alleys and people buying single family houses and turning them into triplexes and so forth. I left 
and moved to the to the uh, highlands. I still own property in the North End, so I am uh, I do have uh, reason to care about it. Uh, I've lived temp in the past, I've lived temporarily in large cities on both the East and the West coasts, and they are a mess, absolute mess. And uh, I've heard a lot about the influx of people into Boise, et cetera. Well, you know, I blame the city for that. Boise City, Chamber of Commerce, the state, et cetera, beat the bushes for people to come here and companies to come here. My sister was living in Los Angeles at the time, and there were ads in the Los Angeles time about get your insurance money because of some of the uh, catastrophes that had happened there and moved to Boise. And it happened, and we kept saying to ourselves, why do they not see what was going to happen? Why doesn't Boise and the people who are trying to, to get people to move here see that it's not all a positive thing? And we said, everybody that has something to say about growth in the Boise area needs to go live in a big city. Go live there and see how horrible it is. And I have children who have lived in Portland and Seattle and have moved out because of what horrible places they are. The inner city of Portland, where uh, there are hardly any setbacks between houses and they've got uh, commercial properties right next to, to um, residential properties. There's no parking, there's crime, there's people all over the place that, that maybe you didn't want in your neighborhoods. Uh, Seattle, downtown Seattle is a mess. And these are progressive and modern cities. So using that term, as far as always positive is not so. My son is the financial administrator of five of the downtown blocks of Seattle that the University of Washington owns. He says it will never recover. You can't get businesses to move down there. The tourists don't want to go down there. You, you know, And he knows. And he gets a list every week of the violent crimes that are going on in, in Seattle. Um, this Shopacher, I'm sorry, your time is oh, up. It is yeah. okay. That's fine. Okay, but anyway, I just I know this is an emotional, mm -hmm. an emotional plea, but I feel like Boise is going down the tubes. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Leanne Mazel, and then Andrew Termich. Okay, and then Jerry Brady. I think you talked. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. You guys are paying attention. You keep me in line. Good evening. Thank, thank you, Commissioner and um, excuse me, Chair, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners for allowing me the opportunity to voice my opposition for this um, upzone that is before us today. My name is Leanne Moselle. I live in the Hillcrest neighborhood of Boise, and I am currently on the Hillcrest Neighborhood Association as well as the um, Legislative District 17 Secretary for um, our, our Ada County GOP. I, um, I, I would like to first address, I believe it was Commissioner Blanchard last night that mentioned that some of the neighborhood associations weren't represented last night or voicing their opinion. I, I think it was you, sir. And I um, just wanted to let you know that as a neighborhood association, a lot of them have uh, voted to be non-political or apolitical. I'm not here representing them today, but that is the reason a lot of them didn't come and voice their concerns um, regarding this tonight. So it's not a lack of caring. It's just they've decided to, you know, keep themselves out of these things. Um, normally, my, I'm more of a facts over feeling kind of person, but there, there was a lot of facts tonight, and I haven't had a chance to go through the 611 pages of confusing verbiage that I read or tried to read, so I'm going to kind of push toward feelings. I was a little frustrated by how the process rolled out. There was a lot of uh, people that seemed to be 
part of NGOs and different part of organizations that have worked directly with you guys that got to speak uh, in the beginning of all of this. And, um, you know, and a lot of the opposition was left out of the beginning of this process. Um, I moved to Boise in 1990 when I was a young adult. It was difficult then to find housing. And it, not because there was a lack of housing, be, be, because life is hard and adulting is hard and you don't always get what you want. You know, um, I, I think Boise has been a place where it's based on families. And, you know, I feel like we're taking away the ability to have two parent families if well, all we're going to be offering is one parking space in a lot of these new housing. And, uh, you know, especially in multi-generational, I, 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 I took care of my mother until she recently died. And I have a son that lives at home with me who's 30. And, you know, it, it's, you know, sometimes you, you kind of have to, you know, pull together as a family and, and, and live like they used to back when I grew up to make it work. I'm a single mom and uh, I, I make it work. I live in Boise. I don't, I don't, I, I don't, I don't have income above the poverty line. Um, I also believe that, you know, Boise is a dog friendly city too, and it needs to be. And, and, and having all these apartments isn't very dog friendly as well. And, you know, probably the most concerning to me is the rapid rise of inflation and food prices and having a home without a yard can, or with a yard can offer food security. During the great depression, a quarter acre lot could feed a family of six and made the difference between life and death. You know, and, and with the way things are changing and food and the availability of food Time. in this day and age, I think that, you know, putting people in apartments and not having the ability to grow your own food or, or have, you know, backyard livestock is also a, a big mistake. So I, I would like to make sure to point that out as well. Okay. I thank, thank you for your time and I appreciate everything you guys have done to try to get this done. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Andrew. Too much? Yeah. Close enough? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Andrew Chumich, and I live at 1500 North 10th Street, Apartment 4. I live in an eight unit apartment complex, and the details may be shocking to some of you. For the entire eight units, there's only one designated parking spot. Additionally, next door, in the middle of the block, is a commercial business, a yoga studio, in an R1C zone. The yoga studio only has two parking spots. Walking around the entire 1.5 acre block, I find 11 single family homes, 10 apartment units, and three ADUs. That's about 16 units per acre, above even what the proposed zoning code allows in R1C. You might be asking yourself, how can anybody live in such conditions? My answer is simple. I don't own a car. Instead, I own two bikes and two healthy legs. This choice has all sorts of benefits. The average cost of car ownership in Idaho is about $500 a month, which I can stash away for retirement or recklessly spend at local businesses. If I pass by somebody I know while walking or riding, I can easily stop and say hi. Additionally, the government doesn't have to spend hundreds of millions of dollars widening roads, highways, and intersections for me to get around. So when Blueprint Boise states its goal is building a sustainable community where integrated economic, social, and environmental systems are structured to support healthy, productive, and meaningful lives for its residents, I think to myself, I already live that kind of life. But on occasion, I have to venture away from my neighborhood into the parts of Boise built under the current zoning code, places where a life like mine is impossible to live. Commercial and residential uses are spread so far apart that every adult member of a household needs a car. How expensive? To accommodate all the cars, the government feels compelled to add new lanes and police officers to patrol them. Also expensive. No wonder property taxes keep going up. The roads are so wide that the tree canopy can't provide shade, making the hot summer months miserable for anybody traveling outside of an air-conditioned car. Because of all these things, children can rarely walk or bike to school. It's too far away and way too dangerous. Our elected leaders and city staff recognize the contradictions between the stated goals of Blueprint Boise and reality. The current zoning code has failed us. The neighborhoods built under the current code are economically fragile, environmentally damaging, and socially isolating. I believe this updated code is the result of an honest attempt at reconciling these problems. Smaller lot sizes, buy right commercial uses, and reduced parking minimums are long overdue. In fact, these are the norm when our most valuable and still most economically productive neighborhoods were built. I encourage the committee to approve this proposed zoning code update. Thank you for your time and all the hard work put into this proposal. 
Yep. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. Wayne Ritchie. Yep. 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 Okay. And then uh, Scott and Aaron uh, Piesch. I know we called you earlier. I think you were gone. Yeah. Yep. The two of them are coming back tomorrow. Okay. Saturday. That's right. And then uh, Jamie say Summer. Oh. Yep. Great. Please, sir. I got in tonight. <laughs> you made it. My name is Wayne Ritchie. I live at 4137 Mountain View. Uh, this code rewrite has a lot of red flags. And the more you look into it, the more red flags you find. Uh, my pet peeve, personally, is parking. Uh, one parking spot per family unit, not apartment, not house, for each household is ridiculous. I, I would bet that every one of you have more than one parking spot at your home. Uh, 2020 census, 23% of Boise has one car or less. 75% have two cars or more. This code is focusing on one fourth of our community and ignoring three fourths of it. That's just not realistic. Uh, my kids have moved back home. They have cars. Uh, I have friends that have parents move back in with them. Uh, most people have to have roommates now. One car per household required parking is simply not realistic. Uh, Mr. Keene will tell you that we have way too much parking. We don't need this much parking. Everybody is going to ride bicycles from now on and take buses. I'm 62 years old. I do not ride a bicycle to the store. Okay. And yeah, Boise is not made up of only 30 years old, three year olds. Okay. Uh, anyway, other red flags, public hearings. I noticed all the neighborhood associations didn't like that. The, the Citizens Advisory Committee was all made up of developers and architects and realtors. They weren't real people, they were developers. Uh, that's a red flag. The city council, uh, not representing all of Boise, that's a red flag. And most of the city council and the mayor live in the North End and because of the historical and the lot sizes, this won't affect them. This is, a, this is a perfect not in my backyard by the mayor and the city council. Uh, Four-story buildings in residential areas, that's a red flag. So we can't build ourselves out of this. We just can't. We all understand supply and demand, but there is an inexhaustible supply of people wanting to move here. You can't build that much to try to accommodate all the new people. The math just isn't there. And uh, if I can address the elephant in the room, and this is what uh, I believe is on everybody's mind. Are we working for the developers or the people that have to live here the rest of their lives? Everything we've talked about, are you cater and, and there's a lot that caters to developers, a lot. Is that what's best for developers or is that what's best for our future? Okay, ask yourself that at the end of every one of these topics, because I think that's what it comes Time. down to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And Jimmy, some, sorry, Summer, Summers? Summer, thank you. And he is the last one on the signups. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Chair and Commission, my name is Jamie Soma, 4247 East Arbor Vitae Court. Um, I'm a fourth generation Texan. My culture taught me that that's a point of pride. It taught me that uh, a person's value comes from their precedence in arriving. Um, my study of history teaches me that that's a very dangerous human instinct. It has no place in how we treat one another. Um, 
My faith teaches me that each person has intrinsic value and dignity, and that that should be how we value one another. My faith teaches me that um, it's my calling to, to love my God by loving my neighbor. Um, it teaches me to value people over my preferences. It teaches me to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. I appreciate all of the time and patience that y'all and the planning staff has given to listening uh, to input. Um, so while uh, I, there's, there's been a lot of things that I think have brought up fear for people, and my, my faith teaches me that the perfect love casts out fear, and that uh, fear has no place in critical decisions about how we treat one another. Um, and so while I empathize with many of the issues that people have raised on both sides of, of the for and against the, the rewrite, I empathize with a number of the reasons that people have given. Um, I'm, I'm coming out in favor of the zoning code rewrite. Um, as I currently understand it, uh, and I am limited and don't understand all the issues, but as I currently understand it, um, the uh, zoning code rewrite, as I understand it, is something that will help remove barriers, remove costs, remove bureaucracy, to allow more of the kinds of diversity of housing that we need uh, in our communities for everyone of all ages, of all origins. Um, and so while I may disagree with some of the reasons that the people against the, the, the rewrite have given, I'm not gonna denigrate them. I'm not gonna demonize them. I think it's important that we listen and understand uh, everybody, everybody's concerns. I'll just close by saying that I moved here from Austin 2019. I saw Austin over a 30 year time period. I love what I see in Boise. I see Boise as kind of like Austin 30, 40 years ago. And Austin has not addressed the underlying zoning mm -hmm. issues. And it has resulted in sprawl. And I will tell you more than, more than a lot of things that people have cited about killing character, sprawl will kill the character of a city. So thank you for your time and the work you do. Okay, thank you. Okay, folks. All right, open, yeah, open mic. Yeah, we made it through the sign up list. Yeah, so we'll start. Yep, yep. Oh, okay, that's great. Come on up, podium's free. Open mic. Open mic now, yeah. And then uh, we're gonna go through the, the folks here in person and then we have a few more folks online too. We'll see if we, we can get to by 10 o'clock here tonight. Please. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hi, um, Chairman, uh, committee members. Uh, my name is Jackie Davidson. I'm a precinct committee member from uh, uh, Precinct 1614 in District 16. And I'm here to speak in opposition of the zoning adoption draft. And Idaho has really been uh, known as a rural family type uh, centered state. It's full of trees and family living. And I've lived here for 42 years. I'm a homeowner in the Southwest Bench area. And I appreciate the density of, the low density of Boise. I have pride in my yard uh, my, and my neighbors do as well. And in the last few years, there've been a, some drastic changes in my neighborhood. There's been a townhome complex and apartment complex built by my house. And to tell you the truth, I have difficulty getting out of my street onto the road. It's, it's become very uh, traffic intense. So that, you know, I, I think that this uh, density thing, it's going to put a burden on the infrastructure and the utilities. You know, the Bent has a really nice, a lot of nice neighborhoods. You know, though they're old, uh, the, these neighborhoods are the American way of life. And they're single residents. They have grass in the front. They have grass in the back. And, you know, they, it's, it's the uh, pride of ownership that these people have that we have in our neighborhood. 
And so when we, you know, when I look at the on page 16 of the code adoption draft and it shows a developer can take a 5,000 square foot lot and turn it into four townhomes in 3,500 square feet, you know, that takes that home ownership away. The residents will be renters with no pride of ownership. Where are the yards? With the trees, oh, oh yes, there's one tree and a little piece of, of yard in the front and cement and asphalt in the backyard. How does that work with the uh, climate change? Also, there's limited parking, and I've seen the results of these type of rental units, and the roads are packed with cars. My neighborhood has limited cars that are parked on the street, and if Boise develops rental apartments, townhomes, the cars will be parked on the streets, will cause road congestion and a sore site. They'll, you only need to look at the corner of 27th and Stewart to see what kind of uh, result of that will take. Also, and many people have said this, that the ele we're electing the Boise City Council this uh, fall. And so I'd really uh, appreciate it if you guys would wait and. And because I don't really have any representative representation in my district right now, I don't have, um, you know, I can't go to the appointed person. Um, I want to go to an elected official. And so, you know, I would recommend that the consideration of this rewrite is postponed until the mayor and city council are solidified. So the only one that wins uh, with this is the uh, developers, in my opinion. So please don't destroy our city with this rewrite. I would recommend that we stay with the current zoning, that we retain home ownership, yards and trees. This is the city of trees and um, we are Idaho. Thank you. Thank you, time. appreciate that, thank you. Okay, anyone else here in person? Come on up, please. So I should have a slide set. Yep. There you go. Yep. There it is. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is uh, Dave Fuji. I represent the Lake Harbor Master Association. I live at 5269 West Silver Lake Lane. There, there's a lot to like in this uh, zone and code rewrite. And Tim Keene over there has, and his team have done a great job in, in a lot of ways. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but I think what you want to hear tonight is what is the bathwater? Um, I, I'd like to focus on a pivotal part of the proposed zoning uh, rewrite, and it's the decision criteria that, that, that directs a huge amount of this body's work in considering CUPs. So next slide. So on the next slide, <laughs> oh, I have the clicker. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. There you go. Okay. Next slide. <laughs> hey, cool. Okay. So here's the existing requirement, which you know by heart. The proposed the proposed use, if it complies with all conditions imposed, will not adversely affect other property of the vicinity. It's simple. The intent is well understood. But here's the proposed requirement. The application will not create any material negative impacts on adjacent properties or any material negative impacts have been mitigated to the maximum extent practic practic practicable. And the public benefits of the application outweigh any material negative impacts that cannot be mitigated. I, I wanna tease apart some things. Adjacent properties versus other properties of the vicinity. Th this change eliminates from consideration most of the properties uh, for impact. Mixed use neighborhoods have a diversity of property uses. Shouldn't we protecting? Shouldn't we be protecting the quality of life within and the character of a neighborhood, and not just the next door properties, which may or may not be adversely affected by a development? Uh, let's talk about material. This is an undefined qualifier, which will likely lead to dismissal of very real, but hard to quantify concerns. Practicable. This means affordable. It potentially gives a developer the excuse. Yes, we're going to negatively impact the area because the tactics to reduce our impact 
are something we cannot afford. Shouldn't the full cost of entering an established area with grace be borne by the newcomer? Or if the cost to, quote, do things right are too high, shouldn't a different site be selected? Public benefit versus negative impact. This consideration tits adverse impact of an area against the very subjective phrase of public benefit and is sure to be detrimental to neighborhoods and in general, the existing area. This body's decision on CUP 2126 was the right call. You upheld both the letter and the spirit of the code and provided protection for the established neighborhood. You were directed to act this way because of this criteria. So please place a value on protecting our neighborhood by retaining the existing code or the existing criteria. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. Commissioners, my name is Dave Kangas. I reside at 1715 West Canal Street. And I'm speaking to you tonight as president of Boise Working Together and leader of the opposition of Boise Reject Boise Upzone. A little bit about Reject Boise Upzone is that our board is consisted of Richard Llewellyn, who's out in Northwest Boise, is on the Citizens and Mitery Committee and really is involved with policy and the infrastructure that's been lacking out there. Uh, Erica Schofield, who's really about public safety. She's our brain. She is just a computer. Uh, Lori DeCare, uh, she is low income affordability. Katie Decker, Veterans Park, who's been more involved with IFS than with us, but she is on our board. Katie Fight, who testified tonight, is really about environment and from the north end. Chris Runyon from the east end is really about the impact of the infill developments and lot splits from the East End. Ed McCluskey, Fred Fritchman from Southeast Boise, who have been heavily impacted by R2 development, especially dorm style duplexes. Myself from the Vista Neighborhood Association, that in the last two years, we have seen an approval of approximately 1,500 building permits. And even if we threw out the Simonich property, I've seen more development in the last two years than we have in the previous 20. And we also, Esty LaFrance, who's president of South Cole Neighborhood Association, who's addressing the far reach of the issues out there. What I wanted to point out with that is, is each of those areas, each of those people representing different neighborhoods all have different issues with the growth and development that has been happening. And that is how complicated it is to try to write a zoning code that encompasses all of Boise with the different varieties that we have. From the beginning, when Tim, when we first met with Tim Keen after his um, arrival, I had suggested that it'd be really wise to just do eight planning districts rec recommending the neighborhood planning areas. That way you had got buy-in from everybody and you probably would have achieved the goals that they were trying to achieve and probably more with less rebellion than what's happened. Um, we've consistently met for over every Friday for consistently in the last six months since IFFs, but we were meeting before then too. So we have taken time, we've pretty comprehensive look at the whole thing, and we've had to readjust and look at this thing three different times because of the changes that have come out. Now, personally, my objection that caused me to just say, no, I am not standing up for this is when the revisions came out midsummer of last year that came out with strategic infill, the new MX corridors. And when I looked at those issues, coupled with the lot size reductions and the potential lot splits, the streamlining of all the applications, I just realized that mm -hmm. this is about production, pure and simple. Somehow, some way, the city wants to achieve 27,000 units in 10 years, which exceeds what they've done in 21, in 21 years. And that's going to be done with infill on an occupied environment. It's built out. It's not spreading out urban sprawl. We're bringing all that energy in. 
Mr. King, I'm sorry. That is not being addressed. Your, your, time, your time is up. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Is there anyone else here in person tonight that would like to speak? The podium is free. Okay. We have a few folks with their hands up online. I'm going to go through those folks, Crystal. Start with David DeHaas and then Ed McCluskey. Oh, sorry. And Don May. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? This is David DeHaas. Hi there. We can hear you. Go ahead, please. Oh, thank you. My name is David DeHaas, 1116 South Vista, Boise, Idaho. I come not only as a citizen in the neighborhoods with R1C homes, these old neighborhoods, but also as a representative of Idaho's for Safe Technology. I ask that more time be given to the public to fully understand all the changes of this zoning code update. I do not agree with the streamlining process, which means a less ability for neighbors to be able to respond to new projects. In 2021, we and members of Idaho's for Safe Technology came before you on the wireless code rewrite. At that time, the council staff and attorneys believe that you are preempted from being able to determine if and where cell towers could be located. You're not preempted at all. Since that time, Ada County commissioners have been denied two cell towers being placed in or near, near homes. Kootenai County commissioners up north have also denied a cell tower. Dalton Gardens, Idaho passed a wireless ordinance that only allows towers if they can prove a substantial gap in coverage by providing drop call records. That's for te telecommunication towers. Like Eagle, Idaho, they will not allow internet towers, these 5G small cells to be put in their cities. We provided Director Keene last fall with a copy of the Dalton Gorge Ordinance as a model for this administration to follow. Our issue is that the new 5G small cells cause a horrendous problem to our health, to the bees, to birds, animals, and humans. We have testified before this body, this technology is not needed as it only provides internet service. I've interviewed no less than seven experts on my radio show who have clearly delineated cell towers being placed as close as 20 feet from homes is an existential threat to humanity. This body talks about following the Boise blueprint. The towers alone obliterated the Boise blueprint goals to have a healthy and sustainable city. First of all, the high frequencies from 5G towers kill the birds, bees, and humans and defoliates the trees. And they're huge energy hogs. Further, on August 13, 2021, the DC Court of Appeals found the FCC to be arbitrary, capricious, and negligent as they've never provided any safety studies that these towers are safe. You've had a physicist testify before this body that he has shared with you these towers can be used as weapons. Right now, I can point to neighborhoods where your neighbors are suffering from AFID, glioblastoma, brain cancer, memory loss, brain fog, tinnitus. St. Luke's has told us that they are now backlogged 18 months to schedule heart ablation surgery to the, those with AFib from these towers. This problem did not exist two years ago. We warned you then and we were warning you again. The big reason you took away the right for citizens to contest in these towers is that the staff stated they didn't have the time to listen to the citizens' complaints. And since this body wrongly believed that you were preempted from denying cell towers, you took away the conditional use permit process, whereby citizens can object to these towers. It seems you're doing this again in some parts of this code for housing. Because of the reasons mentioned above and the fact that fiber optic cable is the safer and faster way to deliver high-speed internet service to our homes in cities in Idaho, we ask that you follow the lead of Eagle Idaho, Dalton Gardens, and others like Ammon, Idaho, Mountain Home, et cetera, and keep cell towers out of residential neighborhoods and away from schools by rewriting the wireless section of this code. It needs to be revisited. And I strongly urge that. Further, looking at as a real estate person, my background years ago with real estate, mm -hmm. uh, I find that the parking requirements are not appropriate. To, de to de decrease parking requirements is just not right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Staff, we have Don May next. Last one. Hands Great. Up. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, my name is Don May, 3108 West Stewart Avenue in Boise's West End. Uh, first, thank you all very much for your service. Uh, you will not find a stronger advocate for building affordable housing than me. I strongly support the proposed affordable housing regulations, including increased density, increased building heights, decreased lot sizes, parking reductions, and neighborhood cafes. In fact, I believe they do not go far enough. I also strongly support the intentions behind the incentive rules regarding the fourplexes, which require that, which require that two of the fourplex units be rented to low-income renters. 
Unfortunately, as I'll show you, they are not grounded in reality. Today's market simply cannot support even a single unit being built at below market rate rents, much less two units. Therefore, no fourplexes will actually get built with these rules. As much as I'd love to build a fourplex under these rules, it just doesn't come anywhere close to making economic sense for me. In fact, I do not know of a single homeowner or small investor who is planning to build one. I'm your proverbial canary in the coal mine, <laughs> warning you uh, that this provision of code, while it has great intentions, is doomed to failure. I've had my finger on the cost of building throughout the Treasure Valley for the past 10 years. For a small 870 square foot unit at $150 per square foot, which I challenge you to build for today, you can build a unit for $131,000 adding 40,000 for horizontal costs and 60,000 for land costs results in a per cost unit of 231,000. Using a management, maintenance, insurance, and property tax fee of 33% of your rent and an interest rate of just 6%, which again, I challenge you to find, the cost to build and maintain a unit and therefore the minimum rent per unit required to just break even is $2,064. According to rentcafe.com, today's average rent for an 870 square foot apartment in Boise is $1,612. Subtracting 2,064 from 1612 results in a loss of $452 per unit per month, even when using my extra low cost assumptions. The bottom line, it barely makes economic sense to build fourplexes and rent them at market rate rents right now, and certainly doesn't make sense at below market rate rents. I highly encourage you to do your due diligence and show other Boise-based developers my costs. These numbers are real. It doesn't do anyone any good, particularly those struggling to afford housing, if you pass legislation that will have literally zero impact on housing being built. So please remove the requirement that fourplexes need to be built with low income rental requirements. Instead, allow homeowners to actually build fourplexes by renting all units at market-based rents. Only then will you actually add much needed housing inventory supply to the market and have a positive impact on affordable housing for renters who desperately need it. It's supply and demand 101. More actual housing supply, even at market rents, always moderates or lowers housing costs. That is a real world mm -hmm. solution to the affordable housing crisis that will actually help. Thank you so much for your time. Okay, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, it is uh, 10 o'clock. We made it through all of our signups and a few additional folks. We are going to recess until tomorrow at five o'clock. We'll see you all back here at that time. Thanks, everybody, for your uh, attendance tonight and your testimony.